What is up, YouTube? We are back here with some more Trials of Miles action on the Sidious Mag YouTube channel. We're coming to you live from Leavenworth, Kansas at Charles J. Burkle Memorial Stadium at University of St. Mary for tonight's Kansas City qualifier. I'm Chris Chavez. I'm the founder of Sidious Mag and the host of the Sidious Mag podcast, and I'm joined alongside 352 miler and former uh, well, w world record holder Kyle Merber. Thank you. Kyle, yep. it's good to be back in the booth. It's so good to be back in the booth. I feel at home in here with you, my roommate. Yeah. Uh, just ready for a good night of track and field. The This time we have a little bit more energy in the stadium. There's there's 300 some fans. semblance of fandom here. Yeah, so things have gotten better since we did our last broadcast at in Austin, Texas at the Texas Qualifier uh, in late February. The vaccine rollout has been going well. We're both Double fully. Yeah. Double vax? Yeah, I'm a Pfizer fan. Are you? I'm Team Pfizer all there the way. There we go. Uh, yeah, we've got some fans in the stands right now. We've got people out on the outskirts of the of the track the with picnic family tables. family is here. This is a family event, so we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to hopefully have uh, some qualifiers for the Olympic trials and, and the uh, Tokyo Summer Games that are coming up really quick. Yeah, you know, we saw in the, the – I guess the undercard is what you were calling it appropriately so, but people were running quick today and the track is hot. Uh, you know, there is a little bit of wind. We're looking at about 75 degrees right now. Okay. Uh, relatively low humidity, uh, 18 mile per hour winds that will come as the evening goes on. But we're, we're in a little bit of a bowl here. We're blocked by the stadium and people are running fast. The track is hot. Yeah, and plus, like, this time around, I think there's a couple different things. We're not going to have the pacing lights on the track. We're going to go old school way. We're gonna just going to have a regular pacer uh, wow. for, for each one of these races. So uh, this will be, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to really get going. What is the, the race that you're looking forward to the most? Well, I'll tell you right now, I'm most nervous to try to call some hurdle races. And that's and the first thing we've got on our plate tonight uh, with the men's. Uh, 110 hurdles and the women's uh, 100 meter hurdles with really strong, I would say strong fields. Very, very impressive fields. And I will take some credit. This was partially my idea to try to incorporate yeah. some hurdles into this meet. I think it's important to bridge the gap between the sprint events and the distance events. And this is a great opportunity. Hopefully we have some big hurdles fans in the chat watching this evening. And we, they've already raced twice a couple of these athletes. Right, so with the format that we have for uh, the hurdles here, each athlete was given the opportunity to race, you know, up at least two times. So you can you could have run in the first round, there was a, technically a semifinal, and then the final. Everyone qualified for the final, you just had to run one of the two races beforehand, so some people opted for the early ones, and then someone, maybe it was like 30, 40 minutes ago, finished up the second one, which we saw like a pretty fast time. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we walked into to the stadium today, Christina Clemens threw down a 12.54, which matches her personal best. I, I'm not sure if it's a legal wind, yeah. but she looked amazing over the hurdles, very smooth. The wind is coming from the side, and it's blocked by the stadium, so... Um, you know, it doesn't seem like she was too affected by it. And I think, it, you know, it's a little different than the, the men's 1500 where you get warmed up. You know, you get a, a couple early races in and you can immediately think about what you want to do better. And, you know, you had a bad first hurdle, like yeah. you immediately get the opportunity to try to do it again. You get to catch a replay on your coach's iPad or phone or something like that. And so, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see if she can go even faster uh, as this final uh, comes up. We'll, we'll have that one, I believe, at 710. Uh, uh, yeah. But the first race will be at seven o'clock with the men's uh, 100 hurdles. I'm um, especially because like 110, 110 hurdles. hurdles. Yeah. That's right. A little uh, bit longer stride. So that we've been studying up on it too. Uh, so the other thing too that we added to this meet that's a little bit different than the Texas qualifier is we've got some steeplechase action uh, on tap tonight. We're going to have an OTQ section for the athletes targeting the qualifying times for uh, the Olympic trials in Eugene, and then we're going to have a separate section with that hopefully will go a little bit faster and not just a couple more people hopefully under the Olympic qualifying mark for the summer games in Tokyo. Um, 
And those will be the last couple races of the night. Uh, Don Cabral, two-time Olympian, is in it. Uh, Sarah Vaughn, uh, who's made a world championship team and making her return to the steeplechase and possibly eyeing a couple, ma like a Masters world record down the stretch. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I'm really looking forward to seeing some steeple action. Well, you know, I think that the steeplechase is one of those events that got hit hardest yeah. the last year from the pandemic. There were virtually no opportunities. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the stadiums that would normally have steeple barriers weren't allowed to host races. And you think so of like a Penn, like Franklin Field at Penn Relays, like it's a college stadium, so they're not like hosting Lots these. of high schools and colleges were shut down. And so there was just a limited number of opportunities or places to get in a steeple chase. And we saw last weekend at Hayward Field that the steeple chasers are ready. They came out firing. And, you know, I think that's traditionally an event in which you build momentum. The first one of the season isn't necessarily going to be the hottest. Sometimes you need to get into the rhythm of going over hurdles, especially the water jump. And people came out hot, and I'm expecting the same thing today. So what you're taking a look at now was one of the most popular features of our Texas qualifier broadcast. It was the drone, and we decided to bring it back. The first time around, uh, we had a little accident where the drone hit one of the goalposts, but there you have it. And this time around, the drone is sponsored. It's sponsored by Hustle Clean, so it is going to be known as the Hustle Clean drone for the rest of the night. We've got these wipes over here. These are the perfect thing that you need for after a long run when you're sweaty, uh, after a workout, if you just need to, you know, you've got a full-time job now, Kyle. Since the last time you were on the air, you still like to hit the track in the mornings, but if you don't have the time to jump in the shower and you're headed to the office, this is the perfect addition. Yes, the office in our guest room. <laughs> um, no, it's really cool that, you know, the, the drone was such a popular feature and really well done and, you know, brought an extra visual to the experience for those watching at home, live, free on YouTube. And so I think this is maybe the perfect time to shout out the chat, which we always love to interact yeah. with. But take advantage of the fact that we have some free track on and uh, maybe share that on share Twitter, link. on Instagram, send it to your mom, to your friends, your teammates, anyone who is maybe interested or they wonder why you're so obsessed with track and field. This is a great opportunity to show them what it's all about. Yeah. So let's learn a little bit more about Hustle Clean and the drones presenting sponsor. Here's a little quick clip to learn more about our drone sponsor for the night. How you do anything is how you do everything. And how you do everything is how you do anything. You know, you have to give your all to being a family man. You have to give your all to being an entrepreneur. You have to give your all to taking care of yourself. No such thing as giving less than 100%. You give 100% in every facet of your life. So we've got, that is Hustle Clean, and the first race of the night is going to be presented by Hustle Clean. It is the men's 110 hurdles. So Hustle Clean provides unisex self-care products for high performers. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it. It's large, so the Hustle Clean body wipe, it's large, durable, full body wipe is designed for a real hustle and a real clean anytime, anywhere, essential for every athlete, every day, and every body. It's proven to kill 99.9% .9 of germs, and this is the time of the year where we, we need something like that. So it leaves your skin feeling clean, fresh, and mo moisturized. It's just like you stepped out of the shower, and so uh, we know that how you do anything is based on how uh, you look, you feel, you smell. So if feeling fresh means you could be your most, most authentic self while you're out there training, grinding, check out Hustle Clean today. All right, so let's just, as we see the men's 110 hurdles now standing in front of their blocks, let's just go through the field really quickly here. Uh, in lane one, we have Matt Prescott. Lane two, Wellington Zaza. Lane three, Brendan Ames. Lane four, Nicholas Anderson. Five, Michael Dixon. Six, Jared Eaton. Seven, Deshaun Jackson. Eight, Israel Nelson. So my eyes in this race are going to be on Jared Eaton. I think he's got the best credentials. 
when it comes to uh, when it comes to this race because he's the 2018 world silver medalist in the 60 meter hurdles, two-time U.S. champion in that event. He's currently unsponsored, training in Phoenix. Uh, but really, I think this season is about him really proving himself that he's more than just a 60 meter hurdler. Uh, I had a conversation with him last week and he's like this, yeah, he's got an outside chance of making this Olympic team and he's he's on a mission to show it. And then the other two guys who ran great in the prelims and semis was uh, Nicholas Anderson from True Fit Athletics. He ran 13.60, so actually coming up the fastest seed time from today. And then Michael Dixon there in the USA kit, he was hot on his heels, 13.61. So they ran well earlier. We're hoping for a clean start. Hopefully the wind dies down right beforehand. Mm -hmm. Michael Dixon, out of 24 years old, out of North Carolina a and T, that's a sprint powerhouse. And there you have a quick look at the flags. It is a little windy, but that's Kansas. Nicholas Anderson looked great earlier today. His personal best is from 2017, but he's getting dangerously close to there. So let's see if he can nab that 13.49. And they're off and they're clean. We have Dixon and Eaton neck and neck up front. As Eaton is starting to pull away. Dixon trying to close the gap and he is and he gets off the final hurdle very quickly to get him at the line. Let's see the results real quick. That was a great race. I mean, you saw the way Eaton got out of the blocks ultimately. Dixon just had that Final three hurdles, he, he just was so smooth and quick over it. And we'll looks go like to the hustle clean drone for this shot. And there's the moment he had eaten up in front for a little bit, but it really came down to the final, it was coming off the final hurdle is where he made his move right in that last stretch. Eaton, Eaton. ran clean, but Dixon just had one gear left. I mean, they ran faster than they did in the prelims. As we said, they had the opportunity to warm up, go to the game film, see where they wanted to improve upon. And Dixon, I believe that we're looking at a 13, 13, 13, 3, 7, 13, 3, 8. So a fantastic race for him. And I believe that is a personal best. Hopefully the wind holds up. We'll, we'll wait for that official reading. A quick thing too. Just to let you know, Hustle Clean has a prediction contest right now on their Instagram, so you can go win a prize pack from their, from them. If you go and check out at Hustle Clean on Instagram, toss them a follow. They're just supporting the sport, and we'd love to see something like that. So check out and give back to the sponsors that help uh, put on events like this for us. I uh, am a big fan of Michael Dixon wearing that USA kit tonight because, you know, he's unsponsored right now, but. He's letting people know that he is legitimate. He got that a few years ago at the USA versus Europe, a couple years ago, I think in 2019, I believe he was fifth there. But this is a guy who is right on the cusp of breaking into making those Olympic and world teams. And the way that he kicked tonight, I mean, went to show it for sure. He ran 1345 at the US championships in 2019 and was just two spots out of making the team for Doha. Solid indoor season uh, th th this year in January, February, you know, had a runner up finish at the American Track League meets. Uh, and so, yeah, I would say keep your eyes on him. It's funny because when I was having this conversation with Jared Eaton last week, I said, so is, is, it, is everyone really just competing for one spot? Because you think Daniel Roberts and Grant Holloway are two really strong guys. And he's like, no, there's 10 reasons why that they're not a lock. It's 10 hurdles in the way. Exactly. You know, anything can happen on that day. But I believe we do have Michael Dixon down on the field with Joshua Potts of the Running Report. Joshua, take it away. Hey, Michael Dixon, how was that race just going? You came on strong in the end, start kicking, start picking it back up. How was that race for you? Um, it wasn't, it wasn't the best race, but I'll take it because I was able to compete. Uh, the first two rounds, well, the first round, I really wanted to get off, but I, I smashed one of the hurdles and it uh, took me off a little bit. And I'm just coming from Drake Relays and I failed because I was, yeah. I, I wanted to get it. So I was like, oh, let me, let me dial back a little bit. 
So I doubted back the first two rounds, and I knew the last round because, you know, Jared is a form of a guy. Yeah. His first, his first five is nasty, and then his last five can be nasty. So I know I'm, I'm gonna have somebody with me, but I just stayed focused. But I kind of messed up in between. I think seven, seven and eight, I hit, but then like my my instincts just kicked, and I was like. I want to win, so. I think it's just really dope because I've seen you on Instagram. You're all like, last week I thought I'd fall. Easy fix. <laughs> it's an easy fix going into this week. So, like, going on going on further, what do you need to fix where you can make that Olympic team this summer? I just races at this point um, because I have the speed, I have the rhythm, but it's just getting next to guys who can go with me mm -hmm. or next to guys and me just not trying to win. Like I said my, in my Instagram post, I was trying to win by three hurdles the first five hurdles. And I can't do that in hurdles. You gotta take what hurdles give you. So it's just getting races in and then getting faster and faster. Like I said this is a decent time, but to win to win the Olympics, you can't go 13 eight. I mean 13 three, you gotta go faster than that. So well man, we're gonna be rooting for you. Watch out for Dixon, man. He's gonna be a problem for more North Carolina A and T. He's you doing his thing. You yeah. doing your thing, man. Appreciate you coming. Yeah, I appreciate you. Appreciate no Kansas City for having this meet, because after I fell at Drake, I told my agent, I said, hey man, I need to meet ASAP. And they hooked they me up right you. here. So appreciate you guys for all you guys are doing and thank you. Back to you, Chris, in the studio. There's Michael Dixon. I think keep your eyes on him as we get closer and closer to the Olympic trials. You know, it's it's a crowded picture for, for that 110 hurdles team. And it's one of those that changes. It feels like it changes every four years um, because, you know, you, you think of Aries Merritt and, and uh, uh, who, who was the uh, huge, he was huge. I'm trying to remember. So David Oliver. So muscular, uh, it, 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 like I, it's, he just had the build of a football player. Uh, and four years later, it was a whole new cast that went out to Rio, except for Aries Merritt, but he's a world record holder, so he's an exception to that. So the turnover in the hurdles, it's a new star can pop off at any time. Well, you know, I think that both on the men's side and the women's side and the, these hurdle events, if you make the team for the United States, you're going with the intent of meddling at the Olympics. And so now as we are looking at the women getting ready, you see uh, you know, someone who knows a little bit about medals, Dawn Harper Nelson there, tying her shoe, getting ready. But just to run through the field real quick, uh, lane two is Muller and Jean, three, Dawn Harper Nelson, four, Christina Clemens, five, Ebony Morrison, six, Tawny Moore. And this race is brought to you by our friends at Run Gooder. They're back. They sponsor some races out in Texas. But all you got to do, find your perfect pair of Gooder sunglasses at Gooder.com and use code KCQualifier for free shipping on your order. They're 25 bucks, so it's like you don't even need a discount code. Just pick them up. Pick up a couple pairs. They're very stylish. There's no slip. No, the Great grip. I love wearing them on all my runs. So check out Gooder. It's Gooder. Dot com use code KC qualifier so here you know in the earlier sections I think we're gonna keep a very close eye on Christina Clemens she ran 1254 looking fantastic and we can go to the replay from earlier today and watch that really quickly this was how long uh, uh, like 40 minutes ago Really pulled away. On the left side of the screen there, you see her really just a dominant win there, but that's the warm up. You gotta, you gotta do it again if you wanna win the final, but uh, she's looking great. And you know, I'm, I'm just really excited to see Dawn out here right now. She's had an unbelievable career already. Now a mother, she is back. And I think every single race that she runs, we're just seeing her get her old legs back underneath her. You know, she's, she's looking like herself and she was 13.08 earlier in the prelims, which you know is probably still a little bit outside of where she hopes to be a month and a half from now. But this is part of the journey, and uh, you know she looked really smooth. The form was efficient. She was not hitting hurdles left and right. Uh, it's just about slowly getting that speed back and sharpening this time of the season. Racing two or three times in a day will help. Yeah, because that PR 12:54 she set in Berlin in 2017. Uh, she set a world leading time. Uh, this past indoor season of 781 in the 60 hurdles. Won her outdoor opener in 1271, clocked to 1259 at the Drake Relays, finished second behind Cindy Semper. So she was eighth at the US Championships in 2019. But that is just one where, again, it's a stacked event in terms of talent from the United States. They swept the medals at the Olympics. 
it's one of the hardest teams to make. I guess like in general, Team USA for the Olympics is one of the hardest teams to make. But if you, you know, focus even further, that 100 hurdles, it's anyone's. If you just have to have the best day of of your life, practically. Yeah, and you know the time that we're looking at right now is 1284, which is the OTQ and the Tokyo Target qualifier, which is an indicator of yeah. just how competitive it is to make this US team. And they're lining up. Something I always appreciate about sprinters as opposed to distance runners is they keep their warm-ups and sweats on as long as possible. <laughs> In lane three, you've got Dawn Harper Nelson, just another stop on her comeback tour. You're becoming a mother. <laughs> and they're off. Clean start. Morrison out hard, but Clemens quickly making it up. Looking very strong. She's not quite away from the field yet. Dawn Harper Nelson is trying to close the gap, but it looks like it's going to be Clemens through the line. She takes it. Morrison in second. That was a 12-6-4 for Clemens, 12-8-4 for Morrison. And Harper Nelson, 12-9-0. You see some clapping for Morrison. That was a, a smooth race. You know, the wind dropped just a little bit before that. I think uh, someone upstairs was looking at these ladies and wanted to give them a good opportunity to run fast. but. They did that, they had the opportunity, and we're gonna go to the replay now. See the way Morrison got out in the first, but Clemens really got off that second hurdle smooth. Unfortunately, Jean had a drop out about halfway through after a hard hit hurdle, but glad she's okay. That drone footage just continues to really give some great perspective to how fast and impressive these women are. Such a technical event and the opportunity to develop those uh, specific skills as the season goes on. Just getting sharper and sharper. This is just the start. I mean, if you're gonna make the team now in the 100 hurdles, you know, you really, you're looking into the low 12s, especially on uh, that fast, beautiful new Hayward Field track. So we've got the 800s coming up. And we're going to have a special guest in the booth for the first time. Uh, I'll share a little bit more, but I think we're going to we're waiting on an interview here. I, you know, I know we said this earlier, but I just want to reiterate. It's really great to have a race that, you know, is very much dominated as a distance meet. We have 800s and 15s, 5K steeples to feature races like the 100 meter hurdles and the 110. I think it's a good opportunity for us to introduce, uh, you know, the, the general distance fan base to what is one of America's best events. Now, this doesn't look too great. Uh, Don Harper Nelson appears to be in a bit of pain. This was her first race under 13 seconds on the season. She finished seventh at the 100 hurdles in Des Moines last weekend. And uh, hopefully this isn't anything too serious that puts a damper on that uh, on, the, on, our, on our trials hopes. Yeah, you know, I mean, Chris, this is something that happens a lot. You finish a race hard and so you, you might tweak a little something. You, I know in my career, I've gone for cool downs in which I'm limping and you, you take a few days easy, you, you get some good massage, you see a chiropractor and you come back brand new. And I know that that was, that was the fastest that she's gone in a while. It was a, a really great performance. And, you know, I am sure that her and her coach are gonna make sure she gets healthy and recovers from this and looks to the rest of the season. Now, as I see Christina making her way to the interview, I'll introduce who our guest is going to be for these 800 races. And it's someone who's made an Olympic team in the 800. One of the greatest races, I would say, to, to watch. It's my favorite race to show friends uh, on, on YouTube who are like not even like huge fans of the sport. Uh, but it's just sort of, you can watch that race, different person each time. And the and it just is, I don't know, it, it will shock you just knowing what's going to happen. We're gonna be joined by the one and only Christian Smith. 
Very, very good to see you. Excited to talk shortly about the 800, which you obviously know a thing or two about. So we're, we're gonna uh, we're gonna get an interview in just a second. So we'll we'll cut to uh, Christian and us in the booth. But all right, we'll we'll toss it over to the running report guys down on the sidelines first. Hey, what's up, Kristen Kyle? We're here with Christina Clemens. Just came away with the dub. How's it feel, Drake Relays? You went out there, got second place, had the world lead indoors in the 16 meter hurdles. Like your season's going good, and you got a dub here at Trials and Miles. How's it feel? It's, it, it makes me feel very excited for trials because that's exactly what I'm thinking about, you know, with this being a trials and miles. It really had it on my mind. Um, I live only 45 minutes away, so a, a meet being here was amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. And we know the women's 100 meter hurdles is such a competitive yeah. event. How does it feel to just been, you've been having such a great season from indoor to now. How does it feel to just, you're ready. Yeah. You're ready. <laughs> it feels great. You know, I give all glory to God. You know, I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot of rupture my Achilles in 2013. It took me four years to get back. And so, you know, I missed the team in 2019 from hitting hurdle seven or hurdle six. And it really broke my heart. So I'm really going for it this year. Well, we rooting for you, Christina, and we can't wait to see you and Eugene. And then hopefully you're going to be there in Tokyo, too. We're yes. excited for you. Yes, thank you so much. No problem. Good luck thank this season. Good luck this season. Thank you. Back guys. to you, Chris and Kyle. All right, so here's Christian Smith. Christian, welcome. Welcome to the booth. So tell us a little bit about what, what are your ties to, to Kansas? Originally from out here, right? Yep, I'm from western Kansas and went to K State. And really, outside of the couple years in Oregon, I've been in Kansas my whole life. Yeah, so what, what is the, like, the high school scene like out here, it, it, like competitive wise? Well, when I was in high school, I, I, Western Kansas, it, it doesn't have uh, a, a lot of competition, um, but but I think that it's definitely raising the bar. There's quite a few guys um, that I've seen run 150, 151, some good 800 guys. Um, I don't know about this year, but there's definitely um, scattered throughout the state some good, good athletes. Does coming to a meet like this make you miss like the competitive days? Yeah, a little bit. And uh, so I have a, a, a four-year-old, and he was asking me why I wasn't racing. And, he was, and I was just like, buddy, I, it's not for me, man. Um, but he just kept asking. And I was, but uh, this will be his first real meet like this. So he's out, out in the grass playing, so it's fun. Very cool. Well, so I know that, you know, 2008 was obviously a very special year for you. For an 800 runner at this time of the year, what are you thinking going into a meet on May 1st? Well, it's starting to get to the point where you want to start testing it a little bit. Um, and if you are if you really want to get through it and be healthy, um, it's a little bit windy tonight. So I think really you just want to have a, a good, solid effort, get to 600 where, where you want to get to and, and see what you have over the last 200. How did you sort of like mentally break down like an 800 and, you know, I, when you're treating something like a tune-up? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the tune-ups, it was all about getting to the 400 in the right pace. Um, so it was always discouraging if we went out like two or three seconds slow because you knew you weren't going to run really fast. So it was all about what the pace is going to be and, and being in position to run fast. Well, let's go through the names real quick, Chris, of the Women's 800 as they are now on the track. Yeah, so in this one we've got Meg Manley, Molly uh, Shugenro, we've got Dana Mecki, Lawrence Coat, Olivia Romano, Sadie Henderson, Annette Melcher, Lauren Johnson, Brenna Detra, and Julia Stepanova. So 10 people in this race. A little bit crowded for an 800, but it seems like everyone is still getting their lane. We're still getting lanes for start. Um, w for you, Christian, where did you always like to kind of find yourself within a field? Were you one of the guys who found themselves in the back and tried to close hard, or would you be up front? Um, I was typically more towards the front. I couldn't close like guys like Nick Simmons and Andrew Weeding. So I had to be out quick, but I, I wasn't like a leader by any means. So I was just hoping that there would be a front runner that would take it out fast. And ideally I would be in the top third of races and, and just try to hold on. So we are looking at an Olympic trials qualifying mark of 202.5. They're looking to be paced through in about 59 seconds for 400. Does that sound about right to you, Christian? Is that, is that <laughs> where you like to be? Well, yeah, no, it sounds about right if you're trying to go close to two. I mean, keeping the, the laps within a couple seconds is probably pretty ideal. Um, it really just kind of depends on how, how well they can manage this wind and, and get through to, to the last 100. 
So, Chris, who are we looking at who are all eyes on for this race? So, Lauren Johnson uh, did a 205-424 double last weekend in Indiana, and I, she's made a world team in the 1500. So, um, I'd keep some tabs on her. But at the same time, I think I'm very curious to see what Julia Stepanova has right now because, you know, she's 30 four years old. She's been living in the United States since 2016. A lot of people know her as one of the big whistleblowers in WADA's expose into Russian state doping. So uh, I'm, cu I'm curious to see what kind of shape she's in at this point in the season. And they're off and it looks like the rabbit really has a, a good sense of pace here as they're going to use this whole straightaway to fall into place, find where they want to be as she's starting to gap the field just a hair in the field is about 28 mid through 200 meters in first place up front that is hit number seven and in melcher representing the u.s air force so the lab is pretty aggressive for this pace so 28 live should have been perfect for running 59 for the first 400 so it's, it's really disadvantage for that leader for the rest of the field brenna detra has taken over up front and as they come through 400 meters at about 60 flat so still right where they want to be uh, you know, I think right now what you want to do is you want to just tuck in, not run any extra distance over the rail, let someone else block that wind for you. And Detra's got an indoor personal best of 202.06 that she set um, in, in, during the indoor season. So she's gone faster than the U.S. standard. Let's see if she can hold on here and, and get the, the outdoor, not only an outdoor PR, but the outdoor standard as well. As they approach 600 meters, you see Henderson just swinging into the lead, 132 flat. So the, uh, a little bit slow there, but coming up on the outside is it's Molly Sugarow. Henderson is starting to put a little bit of a push as just 100 meters left. They're going with a, a side wind out in lane two is Molly. Henderson is really trying to hold on, but it seems like it's gonna be Sugarow coming through the finish line, just a hair outside that two minute mark. She's gonna be just north of the Olympic trials qualifying time. It seems like the wind maybe got a little bit of best than that second lap. Yeah, with this wind, it's, it's tough to, to run close to personal best in this wind. Um, so I think it turned into a little bit more of a strategic race and, and then she just was able to power in the last 100. I think the big thing is, at this point in the year, getting some, moment, some momentum of winning. And you saw Molly there. It was actually 204.3, so a little quicker than we thought. Um, probably won't make the descending order list, but there's going to be more opportunities. And here's the replay from our drone. That's where she closed for the win. She ran at Oklahoma State. Two meets indoors this past season. Ran 207 for it for 800 and 421 for 1500. So she's yeah she's getting there. Fitness is rounding around at just around time, chipping away slowly as, as we lead up to the trials. Well, Christian, something that you would maybe know really well is that as it's about getting to the trials, right? It is, yep. to, You know, for those who maybe don't know their running history quite as well, you were, I believe, one of the last guys into the field and then still made the team. I was. So in 07, I was sick and I had appendicitis, so I missed an entire year. So most people have their standards from the summer before. So um, I was just racing a lot because I wasn't in the fast races and I kept winning races in 147. So it was actually a great progression for me because I was just winning and winning and winning, but I wasn't running fast enough. So I ended up getting in because two people scratched. But Wow forcing me to race as much as I did was was a perfect progression for me. And I think when they're going through the 400 and they go through in 60 point and it's windy, they're changing their mind frame from, all right, we're not gonna necessarily run really fast, but we're, we're gonna have to race. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you can get a lot from that too. Um, and then you just have to change your, your mind frame in the middle of the race. And then anything happens at the trials. Yes. That's right. So thank you, Wazell, for sponsoring that Women's 800. Yeah, so Wazell sponsored that Women's 800. They wanted to pass along the following mention, uh, the message. Attention middle and high school girls in an effort to continue to share the stories of female athletes who excelled in track and field. Track Girls, a nonprofit organization led by Olympian Michelle Freeman 
and wellness coach Jennifer Forrester have teamed up with Wazell to honor legends and trailblazers in the sport. So on May 23rd at 1 p.m., they'll be putting on a virtual master class that will feature four members from the Tennessee State University women's track team known as the Tiger Bells. So check that out. Participants will be able to hear from Wyoming Matthias, the uh, three-time Olympic gold medalist, Edith McGuire, Olympic gold medalist, Lucinda Williams, Olympic gold medalist. That squad was awesome. Mar uh, Martha Watson, four-time Olympian. So the event's going to be held on Sunday, May 23rd at 1 p.m. Register at trackgirls.com. Free for middle and high school girls. $25 for results, and it all benefits track girls. So let's hear from the winner of that Wazell Women's 800. Let's throw it down to the running report, guys. We're here with Molly, and Molly, how was that race really for you at the Texas Qualifier? You didn't have the best performance to come out here Kansas City in the eight, and you get the dove. How was it? Um, it was definitely a really hard effort. They were really good girls in that race that I respected. I really just came out here trying to compete for every spot possible and hoping for the win, knowing I could win, not knowing that I would, and just trying my best. And I see you came away with the dove as you planned. A 204, and I saw you have a 412 PB. Are you more of a 1500 girl, girl or 800 girl? Um, I don't really like to consider myself, like limit myself that way. I'm gonna try and run a fast 15 at the Sound Running in um, California in two weeks. I've had a lot of fun with the eight, so I don't know, just keep trying my best in every event, I guess. What was your mindset going into that last 100? Um, honestly, I'm from the Midwest, so I knew that if I go into the last 100, and I'm there for the win that I'm really strong and I can push into the wind really hard. So I got to the last 100, I'm like, no one's passing me. I guess it's my race. <laughs> I love that, I love that. She she, she got the home cook game a little bit out, out here. Yeah. But thank you so much, Molly. Congratulations on the win. And then back to you, Chris and Kyle. Thank you. Is that Midwest mentality for, for real? Well, I think what she's referring to is, is we deal with wind, so much wind in the Midwest all the time. So I think she was just thinking, you know what? I run this wind all the time, and, and I'm going to power through it. So, um, yeah, she, and she did it. She looked good. Well, now on the track, we have the men's 800 meter. This race is sponsored by Tim Kayala and Joni Bulky Kayala. And they'd specifically like to dedicate this race to Lynn Bulky, a tireless supporter of track and field. Thanks for all you've done. Also, in the spirit of Mother's Day coming up, a big thank you to all the track moms out there for all you do for your athletes and the sport. So thank you both to Tim and Joni for sponsoring this race. After the Texas qualifier, they had reached out and they said, we're big track fans and we want to support both of them. Very good runners in their day. And they wanted to come out and support the 800. And yeah. it, we appreciate their uh, support to make this happen. I, you know, a lot of these athletes wouldn't be here today without the financial support that we have behind us. Yeah, and there's still opportunities for you guys to sponsor a race. Uh, if you're interested, we've got the New York City qualifier on May 21st. So if you're interested, uh, send an email to cooper at trialsofmilesracing.com. And they're off in lane one is Anthony Hawthorne, two, Sergio Miranda, three, Derek Thomas, four, James Gilry, five, Tony Tui Lopez, six, Eric Swinski, seven, Guy Lerma, eight, Michael Rhodes, nine, Oliver Desmuelos, 10, Steven Evans. And up front, Luciano Fiore is our rabbit. He is doubling back today, and he comes through in a swift 24, and Eric Sawinski is slowly coming up to try to close that gap. So Eric Sawinski, obviously one of the most accomplished guys in this field, 2016 World Bronze Indoor Medalist, three-time U.S. champion. He ran 147.73 uh, to finish fourth at the New Hayward Field just last weekend. And I'm very curious to see what kind of shape he's in because he had a really strong indoor season where he ran 145.69 at the American Track League, which so I've always kind of viewed him as like a indoor uh, guy, but now here he is outdoors. Well, as they came through in about 50.8, Eric Swinski is up front with Lopez hot on his shoulders, but we see Michael Rhodes, a familiar face from the Texas qualifier, representing the Air Force. So we have three guys who are starting to break away a bit from the field as Lopez takes the lead going into 600 meters, and they're quick. And we shouldn't be too surprised by this because uh, Lopez Alvarez uh, was the one who gave Isaiah Harris a little bit of a scare, but I'm really curious to see here if we're gonna get a little bit of redemption from Rhodes because Rhodes was the one who did all the work in Texas and now here he is and they turning the tables on Lopez them had one last gear. Rhodes is trying to respond, but he doesn't quite have it. 
and Lopez is gonna hold on in a quick time. He could go all the way. <laughs> wow, what a finish for him. That is incredible. With the wind out here, that is a that is a great performance. Just a fantastic 144. Close. That is so before this, he held the Mexican national record and just improved upon it. It was 145.03 with a personal best that he had from 2019. And look at him, that he is thrilled. That's, that's the Olympic time that he needed. And also in second, a huge race for Michael Rhodes, whose previous personal best was 146.5, and now it's 145.2. But Lopez, I love this energy. It looks like he's he going to the he Olympics. The, he just saw he hit the standard. He is pumped. That's awesome. A shout out to him and huge congrats to Mexico for getting another athlete. So here we go, easy stretch of the race. They're following Luciano. Then there you see Lopez Alvarez patiently waiting to make his move, makes the pass on Suwinski. Rhodes is coming in hot as well, but Rhodes just didn't have the extra gear that, uh, that Lopez Alvarez had. And he ends up with the Olympic qualifier. You know, Rhodes is one of those guys that we were talking about earlier who, you know, come in Olympic year, guys turn it on and, you know, maybe people that you weren't necessarily expecting to be in the mix suddenly have these breakout seasons. He was sixth at the 2019 NCAA Championships. We don't really know what happened in 2020, but now in 2021, he's looking fantastic. Yeah, I mean, just overall, both those guys, the way they powered through the last 300, I was really surprised them going through in 117 and then being able to hold on. I mean, that was, that was a really good race. I remember, uh, you know, I remember being at the, I believe it was the Portland Track Festival and Lopez just dominated that race that day. And I, I remember being like, I was about to run the 1500 and I was watching him go and I'm like, you know, thank you for heating up the track, but who is this guy? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think just the dominance that he showed there, the last 100, he really did have one more gear he, he was saving. And uh, he's very, very uh, much rewarded for it. And so now here he is with Adam, uh, with Aaron and Josh. So we'll toss it to those guys on the sidelines. I'm, I can't wait for this interview. Man, Lopez, you were really hyped after that. Just what are you, what, how do you feel right now? Describe the emotions. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, last year. Uh, me and my coach, uh, we are, was sure this time uh, was possible. Uh, uh, this time is thanks for my coach, and I don't have to say too much. Uh, thanks to my family, my girlfriend, and all the people uh, uh, with me. You really proved that anything is definitely possible with that win, man. It really did. <laughs> Thank you. And I heard that you broke the Mexican national record. What does it mean to have that record? It was a time that. Uh, I tried to break it the last year, but was with the pandemic and the all uh, that happened, it was not possible. But just one race, and this is my third race in the in the year, and uh, reached that time is very uh, uh, exciting. No? Uh, coming the, the Olympics. Yeah, congratulations, man. You killed it. Thank you. Back to you, Chris and Kyle. Okay. So that man is headed hey, to the Olympics. Job. And I also just want to give a huge shout out to our uh, Mexican athlete down there for doing that interview in English. I know if I was in Mexico and I had to do an interview in Spanish, it would not go well. And <laughs> After I took, a race and you, you're just oh, exhausted. Yeah. And, and the emotion, yeah, yeah it, it package it all together. Yeah, it's it, it's a tough, tough task. But no, there he is just uh, you crushing it. You could see that emotion. That, I mean, really. A lot of energy probably pent up from the last year. So we don't know what it's like to, to like you know punch our ticket to the Olympics. But what do you think he's feeling right now as someone oh. who has experienced it? Well, and also he's super excited that this is the third yeah. race of the year on May 1st, and he just broke a national record and punched a ticket to the Olympics. So now he can focus all of his training on no longer trying to run fast in the next month. He, he can refocus on on, on on the actual Olympics and, and really put it together then. So he's going to be able to re redesign his training from now on. So it really sits well to, to run well um, at the Olympics. It's a great opportunity to go back maybe you know, re-up that strength a little bit because it's tough to be in peak form for from the rounds. May 1st all the way through the summer. Absolutely. He'll go into a little bit of a base phase probably and then just 
and then re re peak um, closer to the Olympics. It'll be perfect. Um, I, I also do want to just correct it. He apparently may have already had the standard, but that was a big breakthrough, a personal best, and you know, I guess it raises any questions about what sort of form or fitness he is in. Yeah. Well, Christian, thanks so much for jumping in the booth with us for the 800s. Uh, you got any shout outs you want to make before you go? Uh, uh, I mean, not not specifically, but uh, <laughs> but it was fun. And I really appreciate a meet like this coming to Kansas City, and, and it's awesome. And hopefully that we can make this a regular thing. Um, I know that Nashville, you guys have to come every year. And, and then, I mean, if we're going to get uh, 144, 800 people, I think uh, people are going to want to come here and run fast. I have a feeling that was the track record. Yeah. <laughs> it probably was. That, was. that was impressive. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thanks, great guys. Seeing you. Have a good one. And next on the track, we have the boys' one-mile run. And this is an elite race. A lot of very talented athletes are here with us, not just from the Kansas, Missouri area, but really from all over. So Heartbreak is the presenting sponsor for this race, and they've also teamed up with Trials of Miles uh, for, the for some upcoming races in Jersey City and New York City. So for more information on those, you can check out the Trials of Miles website. But as you can see, Heartbreak has kitted out these high school athletes with special limited edition singlets that read, run hard, risk heartbreak on the back. It, th the interplay of love and heartbreak, it's a fact that you need to risk one to find the other. It's essential to life and to racing. Heartbreak Run. So heartbreakrun.com is your home for culture, lifestyle, and speed, and everything running. And so another cool thing that Heartbreak has provided Kyle and I with is these Never Fold cards. And there's going to be an award tonight for athletes that we feel like have the Never Fold sort of performance. Because, you know, when home is the hardest part of it, so, you know, when the going's getting tough and you know things don't turn out as you as you want like you still gave it your all so we're going to give away two each we got two never fold performance cards so you just keep it in mind as these performances are going and we'll announce who we're going to give them to at the very end all right and the men or the boys i guess mile is off and in lane one, we have Gabe Simonson, two, Ben Green, three, John Schuler, four, Damian Hackett, five, Jack Williams, six, Luis Perez, seven, Peter Vizzer, eight, Ethan Lee, nine, Connor Burns, and ten, Arthur Graham. And I think any question about whether or not you could run fast tonight after we just saw the Mac Mexican national record go down has been eliminated from the conversation. We have a field full of about 414 to 418 guys here who have now a great opportunity to line up against a national caliber field. And they're coming from all over the states, right? There's, a, I think, like four or five different states represented here. Yeah, we. I mean, you, you have uh, Damian Hackett here, who's run 414. He's from DC, he's committed to Cornell. Up front, uh, we do have, I believe that is Luis Perez. He may be the rabbit as they come through in about 66 seconds for the first 409. And they're trying to fall in behind him, let him block the wind. Uh, and, you know, getting on him now is Peter Visser from Star Valley. And Peter is a 414 guy. He's from Wyoming. He's headed to Wichita State. And I don't think you get that many opportunities to get in this caliber field. And so hopefully you can take advantage of it today. So the kits they're wearing are available now on heartbreak.run. Sorry, I had the website wrong at first, but check that out, heartbreak.run. In second place behind him is Ethan Lee. His personal best is 416. He is from Missouri. And so, you know, these guys are lined up. They're just letting Luis do all the work up front. You can just shut your brain off and let someone else block the wind and just worry about that final lap. You just got to get there right now. How much communication do you think goes down between you know high school competitors before race like what do you remember sort of about like the the camaraderie beforehand or like rivalries um so as, as quickly as they come through in 809 meters in about 207 uh you know they're probably talking to each other before the race saying like let's get after it today let's work it let's uh make the most of this because there have been limited opportunities for some of the high school athletes and you get into a, a field like this and it's you know you want to win but really you're also a lot of these guys are trying to show what they've what they're made of to college coaches because the recruiting process has been so weird with the elimination of so many different races. As they come through 1K in two, or I guess 1,009 meters in 239, they're really setting themselves up well for a fast one. And so Luis has stepped off, and up front is still Peter Visser. 
Damian Hackett is on his heels and he's slowly moving to the outside. He's thinking about making a move and he's committed to it. This is anyone's race. They're starting to wind up the pace. He's putting the foot down on the accelerator as they come into 1,200 meters with one lap to go, 13 or 3.11. So really a great opportunity here. I think we might see a sub 60 last lap and a whole bunch of personal bests. And that's great because like right now, as it's something within the high school scene, is just like the opportunities to show out and, and showcase that fitness and that speed aren't there because races have been so limited. So this could be a big recruiting op for some of these guys. And we do have a great pack right here. So we get to see what some of these athletes are made of. Uh, you know, Molly was saying after the 800, Midwesterners are tough, <laughs> they can roll. And so with 200 meters to go, they're 342. So they're set up well. I told you they might be able to break 60 seconds here. And we got Lee making a hard charge right there on the turn. He's looking the, the, the best to me as we have less than 100 meters to go now. Ethan Lee and Visser, Visser are <laughs> Lee with the kick Hackett's of the day. Heels three wide. Who's it going to be? Visser wants it in the front, but can Lee take it to the outside? They're all seeing PRs, and Hackett responds. We're going to see a 4 11 at the finish. What an unbelievable race. And, and, and Hackett just didn't let up from, from, from lane one, didn't give anyone any sort of room. He had to go around him no matter what. Damian Hackett, his personal best was 4.14, and he just went 4.11.8. So an excellent, excellent race for him. He's headed to Cornell, right? Yeah, and look, we're seeing personal best all the way down the field. That is deep, even in sixth place. That is Ben Green from Falmouth all the way from Maine. And he's uh, going to Colorado le uh, next year. His previous personal best was 420. So even sixth place is uh, knocked some time off their previous bests. That was great. I know Riley Masters is doing some some uh, coaching at, at Colorado for a bit, and he's a Maine guy. Was there some uh, recruiting going on? There? Yeah, I don't know. You know I'm going to give some sh uh, shout out to Maine because just in the way that Midwesterners are yeah. tough, when you're that far north, you are as well. Oh, and wow, look a little bit of a arm there in the, at the very beginning at the start there just trying to make some real estate some some room for himself that's but. some good old high school elbows right there yeah. so those guys you know uh, very funny that they would all wear the same jersey today how <laughs> embarrassing but it's no. a really nice jersey i'll give him that if, and it's probably gotten much lighter than you know back in what you used to race in high school yeah, I mean, these guys looked really strong throughout, and the thing that I loved is the way that they moved as a pack. They trade off the lead. No one guy had to do all of the work, because just having someone come up behind you and just say, hey, I'm here, can really help uh, get you out of your slumber, and it just picks the tempo up and it reminds you that we're here to race and we're here to win, and today, that was all Hackett. So we'll be getting an interview with Hackett in just a second. And next up, we're gonna have the ladies on the track, and you know, it's a tough act to follow. Now you've got like a national record, and then like a huge PR. <laughs> that makes a big difference when when you see other people running fast. That gets you in the right headspace. All right, so let's toss it down to the running report guys on the sidelines. Yep. And we're here with Damian Hackett. Just came away with the victory. Damian, how's it feel to just give this big win? Came all the way down for DC. Just like, what were you thinking that last hundred? You know, I was just really thinking about what a great opportunity it was. You know, with the pandemic, there are so few things like this to, that come up, and I just want to take advantage of it, you know, give it everything I had, and uh, that's what I did. Hey, most definitely. You most definitely did. And I saw you're committed to Cornell. I already got that put together. So how does it feel to top off your senior year and, and be going to Cornell? It's great, you know, um, just to continue the senior year of track season um, on a strong note after, after last year. I'd, you know, everything that was canceled was really just great to uh, be able to get out there and run and run against great guys and have fun. Now, how far do you think you can go, Damian? 410, 411, you're trying to get under 410, how far do you think you can go this season? Um, well, school record is 406. So Let's go. That's, uh, that's my short-term goal, and then, you know, in college, we'll see. But, yeah, got a, got a lot of goals. So. Hey, we're going to be watching. We're going to be waiting for you to get that 406. We're going to be looking at the great results, job, Damian. Thank you, brother. Great job out here. Yeah. Back to you, Chris and Kyle. 406, that is a tough school record to try and get after, but I like that he just threw it out there. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's putting it out to the world, speaking into existence. Uh, really happy for him, and he's headed to one of the best conferences out there. The oh, Ivy really? League, the, the heptagonal <laughs> champs. He's going to do well when he shows that he can close like that. But next up on the race, the girls' one-mile run. 
And, you know, I, I was saying this earlier, they know that they can run fast right now. The way the light is hitting the stadium, that wind, you know, it's there, but it's not a heavy wind. The humidity it's dying is down low. too as the night goes on. A little bit more comfortable than when we were in Austin. And so to run through the field real quick, lane one, that's Allison Int, two, Josephine Wellen, three, Mary Grace Hegberg, four, Michaela Clark, five, Ali Negovitich, six, Maya Trober, seven, Ava Parrick, eight, Grace Tyson, nine, Chloe Forrester, 10, Mia Cochran, 11, Megan Ford. So yeah, we've in this one, we've got athletes from Illinois, North Dakota, Oregon, and Missouri. Again, they're all wearing kits from Heartbreak Running Company, one of the sponsors of this meet. I believe the fastest PR in the field is Ava Parrick, and that is a 448. She's also around 1014, and mm. she's here from Illinois. So you're not traveling all this way if you're not going to run fast. I don't think it's too, too far, but still, it's, it's a... It's a good ride, at least like in the car. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know it's a little closer, or uh, it's not quite Missouri. Yeah, you know, but uh, they uh, have a number of athletes in this field who have run about 450 for a mile, and then there's a few athletes who have run five flat 501. Hopefully, trying to get under that magical barrier tonight. Something that you've never been able to do. That's right. And uh, I was waiting for that. Uh, right, we had a sub five earlier today in in one of the earlier uh, girls high school races. So. Again, people, the track is hot right now. Let's take advantage of it. So up front, that is Allison Ince. She is here from Illinois. She's actually the class of 2024, which if Whoa. my math is correct, she's a freshman. And she's up front, and behind her is Chloe Forrester. Here from the, the very uh, well-known Jesuit High School out in Portland. So, oh, really? Um, you know? making her way and we almost have a fall there but she holds on that was Michaela Clark who jumped to the outside uh, the pace is a little bit slow they're looking for probably something in the 72 73 second range and they're sensing it and they are responding so there in second place is Josephine Wayne. a lot of a lot of moving around right now at, at this this early on in a race what uh, how do you try and create space for yourself? Because we've seen, and, and like as a high schooler, you don't know that, right? It, it takes some learning. Yeah, well, so uh, as they come through the 409 meter mark in about 76 flat, I think an important thing to note is you want to not spend extra energy right now fighting with anyone. <laughs> you know, I, I'd almost rather run a little bit wide than constantly be battling elbows and uh, being stressed about being boxed in. You just want to, really, it's more about the mental side of things and allowing your mind to shut off and just stare at the back in front of you and get through as smoothly as possible. And they have picked it up a little bit. That was 6.09 and 151, so they are now below that five minute pace threshold. Similar to the boys race, this one belongs to anyone right now. You know, it's a, it's a talented field, it's deep, and the thing that I really appreciate is that so many of them have personal bests so close together, you know, they're really clustered and they're gonna be able to use each other's momentum and just let competition drag you along to hopefully never before seen times. And yeah, we might see multiple sub fives in this, in this section. And they were 8.09 and about 2.29. And again, the whole pack is right there. They're uh, slowly train off, train off leads. Now it's Mia Cochran up front from Moon Area High School. And she has a personal best of five flat. She's here from Pennsylvania. She didn't come here <laughs> to run another five flat. She's going to make sure that they stay under that 75 second threshold. Listen, I'm sitting here stewing in jealousy right now because they're making it look pretty easy. What did you have to do to get into this race? This would have been a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I've got mine May 21st. I've got and, a couple weeks to get in shape. And Wellen reasserts herself at the front. You know, she sat in the passenger seat for just a bit regrouped and they're slowly stringing out the field. They're breaking apart as the tempo is heating up. They are really starting to eat up ground here as they find themselves hopefully in striking distance uh, with one lap to go. Willen has took control of the pace now. 
Chloe Forrester there on the outside. She is letting everyone know she is here too with 1,200 meters, they're 341. 342, 343 at the bell, so they are well within a personal best. I think, I called it last race, I'm gonna say it again, I think we could see a sub 70 here. Yeah, but the funniest part is too, is just like people, at least in the chat, have been chatting in, it's like these splits worth a little bit more in the Kansas wind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice to ha be running with, you know, five other girls next to you and hopefully just get a little bit of coverage. But you're not thinking about that at this point. At this point, all you're thinking about is what do I need to do to win? And uh, you're going into survival mode here with 200 meters to go in 418. So up front, that is Josephine Willen, who's been up front much of the race, but Chloe Forrester is swinging wide with 100 meters to go. And you can't count out Allison Hintz, who is now making her big move. Allison coming around the final bend. She has flipped into overdrive. She is asserting her dominance, but Forrester, can Not she respond? Up. They had a whole nother gear left. Forrester is gonna try to grab her at the line, but it looks like Ince holds her off. I think her mother is sitting right in front of us, which is going absolutely nuts. It's Everyone's and Forrester, happy. both 450. Mom is fired up. <laughs> this is the beauty of high school racing. <laughs> Mom is running around high-fiving. She is so happy. She's running down to the track. She's That's right in front about. of our booth right now, making her way over, yep. Wow. Yeah, impressive. They closed. Yeah. How many, I think we got, here's a quick replay. Again, a little bunched up at the very beginning. Anyone's race. Ooh, a little bit of a stumble there. Still, it's about 600 meters in, I'm pretty sure. Th did an excellent job of just slowly winding up the pace. They had a very nice negative split going about 229, 220. Lots of sheesh in the comments because that was sheesh. That was quite a bit of a kick. That was awesome. I, you know, I think that there's probably some college coaches watching the stream tonight thinking, oh, right. I, I would take her on my team. When you, yeah. when you see uh, the way some of these athletes competed and, you know, there's been so few opportunities to see how people do in a super deep field like this. And Allison showed that she can handle it. And yeah, I, uh, some of the comments are saying that I would still be on the track competing at this point, but Allison has been done with her race for a while. Now she's with Running Report guys on the sidelines. Hey, Chris, it's really Allison did a great job, but she was low-key nonchalant about that 450 PR. How is it feeling? You swung out right wide that last 100 and you got it done, you got the win. How's, there, how's the emotions right now? It feels great. That was definitely a great girl, group of girls to run with. Um, we took it out a little slower, so it was nice just those first two laps to just kind of like get it in my head. I knew I was going to kick it at the last 100, so it was nice that we took it out a little slower. That way I could just prepare for that last one because I knew we were all going to be grouped together. And that was an awesome kick, awesome kick. You got it done that last 100. And going into that last 100, like you're saying, everyone was so bunched in and boxed up together. Did the wind affect the races? That's why everyone was a little bit more timid to take the lead? I honestly didn't really notice the wind. I think the walls blocked it a lot, but I think mainly just um, just with like those top three who were kicking it in at the end, I think our minds were kind of more on just kicking it in. So you had the better kick instead of the wind. So. And then Allison, I definitely see that you're, you're thinking bigger than this 450. So what's your goal this year really to get down under or win a championship? What goal do you have in mind right now? Um, I think I'd like to get down to like 445. I think um, the mile, I really like the mile. So I think I'll mainly focus on it and try to get down to 445. So yeah, that, that would be tight for underclassmen too. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> but great job, Allison. Back to you and Chris and Kyle in the studio. All right, thank you. So a freshman. Absolutely that crushed was great. it. And uh, now we have the men's 1500 on the line. Chris, who's bringing this one to us? This one 
is brought to you by Freedom Physical Therapy and Training Center. It's an innovative and motivated group of doctors of physical therapy who specialize in high-tech running analysis, running rehab, and stretch training for the running athlete. So if you're a runner in the Kansas City area or anywhere in the Midwest, these guys are educated and experienced in helping you rehab, recover, and train better. So look them up on their website at Freedom P ttc.com or stop by the medical tent on the infield for more information and we are off one kevin kelly two ben weasel three nathan sloan four brian guhara five william sinclair six zach penrod seven weston strum eight thomas farfard nine sydney gitabude uh, 10 jordan mann 11 eric holt 12 brett meyer 13 corey belmore 14 victor palumbo 15 bryce richards and 16 nick carleo as they are coming through 300 meters in about 41 high. Our rabbit is doing a great job, and that is Kevin Kelly from BAA right on him. They are looking at a 337 Olympic trials qualifying time tonight. And ideally, if you don't hit the qualifying time, they go down a descending order list. What do you kind of estimate would be a target time for an athlete to run well here today and be comfortable that they might be on that bubble? Uh, historically, about a 339 low would get you into the Olympic trials, but I think that that's going to come down, look a little bit more like a 338, especially with a longer window this year. I think you're going to need to be in that 338 flat range as they are, you know, being very well paced right now. Kelly is fully committed to going with it, and that is Eric Holt from Empire Elite. And if you guys tuned in to the Texas Qualifier, you might remember Eric, because he won the OTQ Men's 1500 in 341.48. So he's chipping away. He was on the, the bus ride over with us, and he was kind of curious. He's like, I, se I smell a sub 340 coming. So they are rolling. That is a 142 flat. Kelly is up front once again, and he's actually a Drake University alum. He's a uh, was second at the Irish National Championships just a couple of years ago. And so for an athlete like him, he's looking maybe at more than 335.0 Olympic trials qualifying standard okay. or just getting that consistency, fast times, try to get in on rankings. And it, his PR of 341 was set this, this year at the Raleigh Relay, so it's fresh. And they look strong as number 15, Bryce Richards, takes the pace over and Eric Holt's gonna follow him around, but we are fully strung out. We have guys riding this train and they're doing it at a very honest pace as they come through in about 227, 228 at 1,000 meters. Uh, you know, 337.5 is about 58 and you can do that in a very quick, swift, fast lap. And they're all there. They are fully bunched up with 400 meters to go in 244. So I think we're going to see a quick one. Someone's going to make a move from a long ways out. Yeah, and Bryce Richards up in front is a friend of the trials of Miles Circuit. He ran 149.35 at the Texas Qualifier for an 800. And then back from injury, we see Corey Belmore there, the beer mile champ. And, you know, Bryce Richards is slowly getting passed by Eric Holt, but uh, Myers is, is fully responding and going with him. They know that this time is within striking distance as they hit 200 meters in about 313. Holt versus Meyer down in this final stretch, coming right up. Does Meyer have one more gear to respond to? That will be the question. He swings into lane two. Eric Colt is looking. He's gone to the arms, and he has responded. He was in fourth gear. He's looking for a fifth. Myers is going for him, but Eric Colt, all 170 pounds. He was bragging on the bus that he's the biggest miler in the field. 340. Eric Colt, Empire Elite. What a great race. I go on lots of runs with him. He is a strong dude. I can't wait for this interview. I told him I, I'm so excited for Eric. You I, should have seen uh, Troutman, Coach Troutman in the infield just waving his arms as if like someone was like about to hit a home run. And I, I'd say he did with that race. On the bus ride over, Eric yelled to me. He said, Kyle, you know a thing or two about running. What can I do about this wind? And I said, Eric, no one can squat more than you in this field. I think you've got nothing to worry about. And he is getting hugs from his teammates. That's really exciting. Super happy for Eric Holt. I hope Eric Gold, uh, Holt goes for the trifecta and runs at the New York City qualifier because then he'd be three for three at Trials of Miles events. Oh, man, that is exciting. You know, it's still a little bit outside of that window for the Olympic trials qualifying time, but it's about momentum, and he's going to have those opportunities. A lot of these athletes are just trying to 
get into that race. You're, you're flying around the country looking for the, the right opportunity, and this is going to help Eric's case to get into that next race that maybe gets won in 336, and then he doesn't have to do so much work. But really, really excited. I told him he reminds me of Ford Palmer back in the day. I know. I, I see this, the, the comparisons just in, you know, coming from another sport, finding, you know, getting stuck at four flat for the mile, and now having a really strong summer uh, to really break out and start to make a name for himself. So he's down now. Eric is on the track now with uh, Aaron and Josh. Yeah, Eric, you ran a really great race, a hard finish at the end. Second second Charles and Miles win, bro. How's it feel? I see you were kind of feeling yourself yeah, I know. at the end. How's it, how's it feel? Well, you know, I wanted to talk to my boy, uh, Kyle Merber again. I couldn't let him down. So, and But, no, in all seriousness, you know, uh, this year has been a dream come true. I get to train with a 349 miler, Johnny Gregork. Like, it's, come on, man. I That's stuff I dreamed of as a kid, you know? But uh, honestly, you know, since training with, you know, John Gregork and training with uh, the world lead in the Siebel Chase, Isaac Updake, you know, that that just like gives me so much confidence that uh, I can come out here and win. Yeah, man, you really killed it. You killed it today. I love the pride that you have for your team and your teammates. Can you tell us a little bit more about Empire Elite? I know you guys are a new club. Oh, I'd love to. You know, we're a small club. We're new, but we have two of the best coaches. John Trotman, who made the Olympics in 92. And of course, you can't forget Tom Nohilly, who was a stud back in the time. So, you know, I'm just surrounded by excellence and we're small, but everyone out there is tenacious and very hungry and ready to get it. And it's contagious. And, you know, that's that's what happens. You're out some big names right now, some big times. Do y'all have a sponsor? And, and what, tell the people right now, y'all y'all need to inspire Empire Elite. Oh, the money. absolutely. You know, uh, wait till this trials, man. I think it's going to be a big surprise, Empire Elite. It's going to be one of the biggest clubs out there. So. Hey, love to hear it. Love to hear it, Eric, man. Congratulations. Yeah, Great race. Thank you so much. Back to you guys. <laughs> that was amazing. Oh, never disappoints. He's my favorite person. <laughs> he, he's a monster. I Honestly, no one works out like Eric Holt. He, uh, he was a boxer and just yeah. has that mentality. He brings it to the track every single day. Uh, really fired up for him, you know. On the bus ride over, he was joking. He says that he doesn't have health insurance. His health insurance is up in 11 days, and he asked <laughs> how fast he would have to run in order to get it. I told him if you make the Olympics, you know, yeah, that will definitely help with USATF. Yeah. So he's uh, he's working his way for for some health insurance. And uh, take a look at this. This is beautiful. This is the nice Kansas sunset for you guys, just to set the mood because these races are. They're, that they're, was, they're great. That was so. That was the highlight of the night for me. Um, <laughs> Eric uh, fired up about Empire Elite, and you know we we did see Isaac Updike, his teammate, uh, run 8:17 last weekend, the world lead in the steeplechase at Hayward Field, and so nice little training group we got going there in uh, Westchester. I go I, I go for the warm ups and cool down sometimes, okay. <laughs> yeah, or I'll do strides, but. Uh, no longer hopping in. Love that the chat was just like, Eric Holt is now my new favorite athlete. Yeah, that is uh, very appropriate and a good choice. And he uh, he really does look up to Johnny, and they they work really well together. And, you know, we saw Luciano earlier, another Empire Elite athlete, and he... Uh, Finished second in the 800. Yep, and so uh, good squad. And now next up, we have another fast race for us. It's the women's 1500. Presented by Wazell again. So a reminder, they've got, they've partnered with Track Girls to honor some legends and trailblazers in the sport. You can sign up now for a virtual masterclass on May 23rd that will feature some of the legends from the Tennessee State University women's track team, the Tiger Bells. So the event will be held on May 23rd at 1 p.m. You can register now at trackgirls.com. That's T A R C K G I R L Z.com. And it's free for middle and high school girls, $25 for adults, and all benefits go to Track Girls. So uh, now we have the women's 1500 in lane one. That's Angel Picarillo, two, Taylor Werner, three, Jennifer Martinez, four, Therese Heiss, five, Leanne Farber, six, Ayla Granados, seven, Amanda Rigo, eight, Tabor Scholl, nine, Mariah Kelly, 10, Jenna Hinkle, 
11, Jamie Morrissey, 12, Audrey D D Damio, and 13, Lauren Johnson. Chris, who are your eyes on? Well, I'm very curious to see how this double is going to go for Taylor Werner, and this is just the first leg of it. She's entered in both the 1500 and the 5K, and uh, you know she signed with uh, Puma just a couple months ago, opened her year with an 8.56 for 3K in her professional debut at the Prickly Pear Invitational. And then she ran, uh, she's also run 15.11 for the 5K indoors and 15.38 outdoors. So we'll see what she does in that event later on in the night. But she had a little bit of an off race recently, so this could be a good rebound for her. I'm, I'm curious to see how she uh, responds. Another person I'm watching is Angel Piccarillo. Uh, hip Great number sponsored one, by Wazell, and Wazell. she's a Wazell athlete, yeah. You know, she is uh, one of the many studs to come out of Villanova through the years, and she is training up in Bend, and she's looking very strong this year. Uh, she ran a personal best at, at the Washington indoor track Dempsey uh, this winter, sh where she ran 430, and... I think the 1500 really suits her even better. She has some great 800 wheels, and so just that slightly faster tempo does favor her. And then another athlete I do want to keep an eye on is Hip7. You can see her on the screen, Amanda Rigo. Mm -hmm. You may remember uh, her as Amanda Winslow. She okay. ran 426 uh, when we were on the team back in the day at the New Jersey New York Track Club, and then she had some really serious injuries. I mean, she missed four years like actually four years with a hamstring injury before getting surgery and she's back she's healthy she's running she's out in colorado springs and, and julie she, benson right coached by julie benson and she ran 412 earlier this season to like that's her that's her default mm -hmm. like this is she's super talented and if she's healthy then she's someone that can really reinsert herself into the conversation in american women's distance running And the time that we are looking at tonight for the OTQ is 4.060. And so that's about 65 mid. And they're off here. We have 100 meters to figure this out, see where everyone is going to fall into place as our rabbit on the outside is slowly moving up to the field. And I said Amanda was going to be someone to watch. And, you it's know, the two people you picked. I, I know a thing or two about the 1500. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they look very honest right now. The, the rabbit knows the pace. You know, she's not going out too hot, about 32 seconds, which is perfect. We're looking at 65 mids, and they're slowly finding their way. No one wants to run any extra distance. We're going to work together tonight to get some OTQs. As they come through 300 meters in 49 seconds, they are right on pace. They are relaxed. Uh, in third place, that is Jennifer Martinez. And you rem may remember her uh, a few years ago at the NCAA championships. She was running for Oklahoma State as Jennifer Sellis, and she was seventh. And, you know, I, she said she was going to walk away from the sport, but she's back, and she is super talented and just, you know, is someone that I'm really happy to see lining up again. Yeah, we were talking to uh, Craig Nowak yesterday. He was like, yeah, keep your eyes on her. You know, it's been a rough little bit of a stretch with, with injuries, but, you know, the talent never fades. And there behind her is Mariah Kelly uh, representing Canada. And she has a personal best of 409, so some, one of the fastest personal bests in the field. Uh, not afraid to go with these ladies at a quick tempo like this, but it is Angel up front, and the rabbit is doing a wonderful job. Amanda is just staring at Angel's back. They're going to let this come down to the last lap. Uh, they're going to work together and just try to knock this thing out of the park. Yeah, Mariah Kelly there was uh Clawing her way back is a little bit of a gap for him, but wanted to, to close it and is still in contention right there in the third spot. Um, she just ran 416 at the Drake Relays last weekend. And so we are looking at 800 meters and about 214, which does set themselves up well. They're going to be able to make up that time in the final lap, especially if we have a race. But Angel is uh, creeping up into the lead, passing our rabbit. She has just one step on Amanda, who is quick to cover it. And they look very, very strong with just 600 meters to go. She's like, this is a Wazell race. I got I to gotta put on for the sponsor. <laughs> Some pressure there, uh, but they're looking great as uh, hip number six. That is Isla 
Granados from Hoka slowly trying to bridge the gap. Uh, you know, I think she has a little bit more of a 5K background, so we're going to expect to see her finish strong. Angel looking super composed. Amanda, you can see, is just looking at her heels, trying to bide her time. Mariah is looking up with 400 meters to go. They are coming through in 3.05. So they're going to need to run quick, but they have the, the ladies to do it with, and hopefully they don't wait too long so that way this thing can move. Right now, the wind is at their back. You can really start winding them up early. Picarilla has been leading for quite a bit right now. I remember her when she was on those pen relay teams uh, with Villanova. Always found a gear to finish strong. Let's see if she's got it here. Mariah going into the outside of lane one is a great sign. She's positioning herself to make that move as they hit 200 meters at 338. So they're going to need a quick one. Uh, at the very least, we have some PRs in sight. But Ayla is right there. She, as I predicted, has a very strong second half, but still Angel up front as Mariah is thinking about making the move. Does she have that one last final gear? This is going to be a real tight one. They are absolutely cooking right now. And Ayla has found that final fifth gear as she pulls it up with 50 meters to go. She is all out right now. She found the nitro and she comes through the line for the win in 4.11. A little bit of D2 love here. The uh, star out of Chico State holds the 1500 meter school record there. You know, she sat back, she bided her time, she worked her way through the field and had that one final thing that everyone was looking for Came at the end. It was a little bit of a surprise because like there was a, a, a tiny, tiny gap on that backstretch in the last 200 meters. There's this notion that, you know, that final 100's all speed. It's not, it's strength. <laughs> it's strength and, you know, it's not like you're running a, a pace that you can't run. It's just a matter of can you do it when you're tired? And she really proved that uh, she's strong right now. I mean, we've been seeing her in 5Ks recently, and so coming down, probably that pace was a little intimidating early on. But yeah, she's a two-time All-American in cross country at, at the Division II level, so the strength is definitely there. Yeah, so, she, uh, you know, big shout out to her. She looked great, and Angel Mariah also, also, you know, very, very strong races here tonight. Just fun track and field to watch. That was exciting. And, and, and they standing up. The cool thing, too, is that people are getting closer. Like, we see some of these PRs set in June of 2019 or July of 2019. And you kind of just have to remember that's technically, really, only last season because last year was a wash when it came to, to the outdoor opportunities. So let's uh, let's hear what Ayla's been up to during the pandemic and training to get to this point. Let's toss it over to the running report, guys. So Ava, you're just telling us it's been a while since you got a post collegiate win. Like you think it's like five, six years. How's it feel? You went out, you went out wide, got the dub, just came out of nowhere. What was really going through your mind? How's it feel getting that win? Honestly, like I wouldn't say like surreal, but it like when I was in the race, I was like, well, like this is happening because like usually. I've kind of been like the last person in a fast heat. And so it'd be like a game of like, just hold on as long as you can. And so I think once you kind of go through that for a few years, it's like inevitable that like eventually you're gonna be up there in the fast heat. It's just like, it's taken, I think longer than I thought it would. So it's like that much sweeter. Like I'm gonna remember this forever. <laughs> yeah, it's here, this is your time. Yeah. You made a really big move, like that last 300, like gradually catching up everyone, then swinging wide. Like, yeah. where did that confidence come from in that last 100? Honestly, fitness. Like, the more fit you are, the more confident you are. And I think this year, it wasn't just because it was an Olympic year. It was more like I've kind of been tinkering with doing doing running, but also doing other things. And this year, I'm like, I'm just gonna focus on training, get as fit as possible. And so. It wasn't that big of a surprise because I have been like training at altitude and like really putting in work, but it's still super surreal when it happens for the first time. Well, yeah, it was great watching it. I'm sure you got big things planned ahead. What meets are you looking forward to? Um, well, after this one, I actually decided 
Um, like last night, I was like, I'm gonna do Trials of Miles New York. Like, I want to like make this season as fun as possible and also run as fast as possible. But I just feel like I have nothing to lose to so just like race as much as I can up until the trials. And so that's like another one I'm looking forward to. Sound running, like all the people who've been putting on like these meets, like it's honestly like been a game changer. So, like it like gets me like more excited than I've ever been to like come out and race. Because like races used to be kind of like. I don't know, you know. They don't have the energy that they have yeah, here. Like the, energy yeah. was, the energy was always like a hit or miss. And so for it to just be like the norm is like so nice. Like for me, it like helps so much to have good energy. Like I think other people might, might not need it. But for someone like me, like I definitely need like energy around me to like perform well. Hey. So thank you guys. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. Yeah, y'all heard her here first from the 1500 meter winner. She likes energy. She likes Charles and Miles. And she's a great runner that we're going to see real soon. Yeah, yes, well, sir. Just seeing you guys yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely. <laughs> Back to you, Chris and Kyle. What a great interview. That was awesome. And also, yeah. just shout out to Aaron Jot. You know, they're really killing they're, it down yeah, there. Yeah, they're having so much fun down there. It's, it's great to see. And uh, if you're enjoying Aaron and Josh, check out their podcast, the Two Black Runners podcast. Their YouTube channel is also really, really impressive. Uh, they're doing they, great stuff. They practically put together, like, a whole, like, track and field recap show. Yeah, it's like PTI. It's, yeah, so check out the running report on, uh, on YouTube. And also just super composed thoughts from him after a race, like some yeah. unbelievable perspective. Normally, I, I, you know, you see people in a trash can, but she was uh, spent some really wise philosophy right there. So coming up next, we've got the men's OTQ steeplechase. But before that, we've got a quick word from our sponsor, Whoop. I think the biggest thing with Whoop is accountability. We're able to clearly see what we're doing on an everyday basis and seeing how that affects our running, how that affects our recovery. I think Whoop is super important. It's the all-encompassing mindset of a runner that your recovery is just as important as the actual work itself. I think that's where Whoop is really huge is just providing some consistent data where I'm able to see trends, whether that's trending poorly or trending in an upward direction. Whoop has stepped it up to sponsor the City of Smack podcast and a lot of this. All the winners at tonight's meet and the second place finishers are walking away with a Whoop band and one year of uh, a subscription. So uh, really cool to have them involved in the sport and uh, you'll see more of them, I'm sure. All right. And the men's 3,000 meter steeplechase, the Olympic trials qualifying section is off. Lane one, Joshua Espinoza. Two, Gable Cipierda. Three, Cesar Daniel Gomez Ponce. Four, Joseph Beratua. Five, Jackson Saylor. Six, Shimalis Abibi. Seven, Ian O'Hilly. Eight, Dylan Doss. Nine, Jackson Lewis. 10, Evan Verbal. 11, Simon Granisha. 12, Heron Dunderdale. 13, Jordan Cross. 14, Craig Huff. 15, Jackson Neff. 16, Pedro Garcia Palencia. So this one, they're going for the U.S. Olympic Trials qualifying time of 8.32. And some of the guys in this race were in a race at Eastern Kentucky that was a little bit short. We've got more of those guys in the later race. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit of a do-over. Right up in the front, the guy you just saw in that commercial, Joey Barriatua out of Santa Clara, training with Tin Man Elite. And so, you know, the, the splits in the steeplechase are difficult, to say the least, because you're not actually running 400 meters per lap on an inside barrier. It's probably more like 390, 395, somewhere in there, as they hit the water pit for the first time there. Uh, Sailor looking great up front, Joey there. And it's it can be a little complicated to kind of even understand what pace you're running. I think that they were about 67 seconds through 400 meters, but really like, that's a little bit short. And uh, for the first lap, you don't have any hurdles that first 200 meters. And then now it's four barriers a lap and then one water pit. There we go. I've done the steeplechase. It's extremely difficult. There's well, a lot to it. You ruined my joke. I was going to read the steeplechase Wikipedia page, just like the guy at the Istanbul Half Marathon. You can still do that. Okay. We have more steeplechases to go. Uh, so right there, nothing has really changed up at the front of the race because Joey Barrier 2 is just glued to your pacer. Uh, and right behind him is 
I believe, out of Mexico. That is Cesar Daniel Gomez Ponce. Ponce. Um, you know, and Sailor, it's rare to have a rabbit in a steeplechase. It's really difficult. We were talking to Craig, uh, uh, Craig Nowak about this yesterday, about just how tough it is to of a steeple uh, to, to pace a steeplechase because you've got to clear the water the water pit and the and the hurdles as well. It's a lot of pressure, you know, because if you stumble, all those guys. Ooh, and we see one fall, but he's quickly back up. I am trying to get a read. He's Hopefully stumbling. he's okay. Oh, okay. Hopefully he can uh, get his. Composure. He immediately starts moving back up into the field. So good kudos to him. But yeah, you know the rabbit. It's such an important job. You're you're setting the tempo, but you do have to do it really smooth. And uh, he's doing it effortlessly up front. But Joey, you can see he swings wide into lane two uh, every time you see them come to a barrier because you want to be able to see it. You want to see where what you're jumping over. And so. You know, as opposed to some of the flat races, that little bit of extra distance, it's actually an advantage to know that you can hurdle clean. Yeah, and Joey's taking no risk and, and, and with, with this one because, you know, he ran 8.39 last weekend, or, or two weekends ago, at that race in, in Richmond, Kentucky. And so he's one of those people who has wanted so many things. He's wanted the sub four miler and has come super close, running to the point of four flat. And the trials is his like big thing that he's, he really wants to go for right now. That's where his focus is at. And, and it's in this event that he's got the best shot to make it. That's what all these guys are looking at. Um, you know, how can I qualify? How, and there are, as we said earlier, there's been limited opportunities and you've got to make the most of them when you do have them. But here they are, they're approaching four laps to go. They're looking at about 4.06 with a mile to run. And so it's been honest. You can see that they're well uh, spread out throughout the field. And it's it's really, it starts to hurt about 2K into a steeplechase. Like you start, you start feeling bricks and those hurdles start getting higher and higher. At least it would feel that way. So that steeplechase that Joey ran was estimated by Craig to be about 50 meters short. So maybe about six seconds or so. Um, but it's not necessarily, you know, it's good to have the opportunity to jump over some water barriers and get that under your belt. Generally speaking, your second steeplechase is often the fastest one, as opposed to the first. So now that the pacer has stepped off, it is just, the, it's down to the racers. And uh, Shamal Abebe, who almost took a tumble before, has really recovered and is up there in that top three. Cesar Daniel Gomez Ponce up in, up in the front as well in that lead pack. You've got three guys really working together. This is a, a pretty big breakout race from Shamalis. I think his personal best is 9.06. Is that correct, Chris? I, uh, I've got to double check, but he's training out of uh, Oklahoma City University in AI. With school. Zuhair. Zuhair Tlaib. Uh, Who we're going to see later tonight. So, so they so have a great training group down there, don't exactly, they? Exactly, yeah. You know, you train with guys at, who are at a high level doing big things and you key off of them. You key off of them every single day. You key off of them at practice and then at life. And that mentality is really contagious. And so we often do see that programs rise and fall together. And uh, Oklahoma City, there, you know, there's something special going down there right now in the NAIA. They're coming up on this barrier. You can see the Heartbreak Dot Run logo there presenting sponsor of this meet in Kansas City, as well as the one in Jersey City and New York City. So shout out to the team at Heartbreak. Check them out at heartbreak.com. And there in second place is Jordan Cross, representing Tracksmith. His personal best is 841 from 2018. Uh, he ran a low-key steeplechase earlier in the year in Idaho. And he competed for Weber State. He was at the NCAA Champs in 2018. And he's one of those guys. 841 can become an 832 really quickly in the steeplechase. You know, you tighten up the form, you uh, get in the right field, and all of a sudden, nine seconds are off like that. And he looks great, he looks strong. Joey's up front, uh, bringing the guys along. He, uh, it looks like he almost motioned to Jordan right there, like, hey, you take it. And Abibe sees that move and starts to follow him as they come up to, uh, what is this, 600 meters to go. Yeah. These are 
crucial water pits. Right now, it's just about getting them, getting through smooth. You don't want any stumbles. You, you just want to get in and out of the pit, one foot in, let that water break the ball a little bit, and push through, and you're, you're thinking at this point, hurdle to hurdle. So Joey has lost a little bit of a touch with the lead pack in third, uh, just behind him. But Jordan Cross is up front, 734, 735, with, with just under 400 meters to go. He's certainly within striking distance of his personal best. That 832, he's gonna need to close like a madman, but with the descending order list, you, every second counts. You don't know who's gonna be that last man in, and you're racing ghosts at this point. He looks super composed right now. He is definitely picking it up as he makes it clear through that barrier and with just under 200 meters to go, he's 807. Maybe we could get an above ground shot on this one because these guys are doing a great job of clearing these pits. And he makes it through cleanly and now he's got one more barrier to go between him and hopefully a new personal best with 100 meters. So he's gonna get close, but not quite for the US. Jumping like a 400 hurdler. He is shoveling Cole into the fire, and he is seeing the clock. He eyes it. He wants that personal best. It's been a few years, and he dips under that 840 mark. Fantastic race for Jordan, representing Tracksmith, and then behind him, a huge personal best for Shamalas Abibe, despite falling. Yeah, way to rebound in that second half of the race. Kind of almost looked like he was injured at one point, but managed to get over the barriers. But one that came up really soon after. Getting some hugs for that victory. Really, really excited. Uh, you know, he had done one earlier this year. I said it, that first one, oftentimes just a rust buster. And he took 17 seconds off in, uh, since April. So, you know, that is obviously super promising, but the the fact that he won, you know, that's some serious momentum, and now he's gonna be looking down the schedule and trying to find that next place where he can uh, hopefully take just seven more seconds off. The Oklahoma City Distance Squad. You gotta keep your eyes on them. Yeah, I mean, they're doing something special down there. I'm excited to see Zuhair come back and race later. He's been uh, rolling in the NAIA. You know, at Austin, we, he dominated that 10K, quite frankly. Uh, not so we'll get a lightly. nice little rematch later, because Sam Shalango is in that race. Uh, and now we get to see him at half the distance. But first, we've got Jordan Cross with the running report, guys. But Jordan, how was that race for you, man? You went out there, got a big PR, really killed it last, like, 600 meters. How is everything? What's going through your mind right now? Oh, man. You know, my brother flew out here, and... Uh, he made a t-shirt for me, it says, but they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, but shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not faint, or shall I run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. And I was just kind of meditating on that before my race. Um, I haven't really been racing the last three years. I had to have surgery on my Achilles after uh, NCAA's 2018. And uh, so this is my, kind of my first real competition since 2018. And I just feel so honored and blessed to be out here and have this opportunity to compete and really just see what God's blessed me with. Yeah, that's really what it's all about, definitely. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Brad. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, man, that's that's one of my that's one of my favorite verses, right, right there. You know, putting your hope in the Lord and just waiting on Him, and He came through for you. Yes, sir. Yeah. And it seemed like you, it seemed like that race came to you pretty easy. You don't, you didn't seem too tired afterwards either. No, I um, I was kind of just really patient because I haven't really been uh been competing a whole lot and I just said you know like I don't want to go out there in like a 65 and blow up let's just just kind of go out to the back work my way up to the front and just be patient and just kind of see how the race plays out because the last thing I want to do is just kind of run a really bad race and have that the last thing in my mind going forward I want to keep that trial standard of sub 832 in my mind and just keep chipping away at it well, he looks great out there, and I, I love the tracks with him, but back to Joshua. Man, after that great performance and last thing, what have you learned about yourself from that, and what are you going to be pushing for in 2021? And what's the real goal? My, my goal is just to, to continue uh, striving forward for that that uh, Olympic trials standard, as I said before, but I want to uh, to continue it, and I want to be in the Olympic trials final 
um, come June. That's kind of the ultimate goal that I'm shooting for. So, you know, I still got more races to go to, to try to hit that standard. But um, I think it's just being patient and, and just kind of just seeing how the Lord directs my paths. I just kind of where I'm going to go with it. We appreciate you, Cross, and thank you for that little sermon before we get to Sunday church tomorrow. We really do appreciate you, man. Back to you, Chris and Kyle. Here's his deciding move. I mean, just to, you got to keep the faith. I mean, I kept a couple of injuries, set him back for the last couple of years, but now he's coming back strong with a chance in his eyes on the U.S. Olympic trials. So, so that race was brought to us by someone very special, Chris. Yeah. Do you want to read this, the, the men's OTQ steeplechase sponsor? This is one of the, my favorites of the night. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think one of the big things that Ayla was talking about is just how a lot of these grassroots meets have popped up, and it's due in part to thanks to the local sponsors of some of these. So we're here in Kansas right now, but that, do you live in Atlanta? Does your house need a new roof? Of course it does. So for your roofing needs to be done, do it right with Do Right Roofing, and they won't do you no wrong. So follow them on Instagram, at Do Right Roofing. You know what? I'm putting this out there right now for everyone in the chat. Go to Do Right Roofing's Instagram, and on their latest post, just say, hey, thanks for sponsoring the yeah, race Yeah, that's a good idea. I you just make that up? Yeah, I want to see it in the that's comments cool. section. Yeah. When I check out the Do Right Roofing Instagram account later tonight, I want to see a lot of people just giving them props for supporting the sport. Yeah, so. let's go. Message, do right roofing, throw them a follow, throw them a like, let them know that even all the way here in Kansas, we know if we're ever homeowners in Atlanta where we are getting our roofs done I, I know right. for a fact with, you know, these thousands of people watching right now, we've got some people out in Atlanta, so, you know. There look, must be a couple. Take a look up at your roof. You, you probably need to do we, If we get, like, one person to convert and I mean, that, get their roof done in Atlanta, then that sponsorship was worth it. But then the women's steeplechase, we actually have a really great sponsor again as they are on the track here, the women's 3,000 meter OTQ section. I'll read through the names real quick. One, Alicia Douglas. Two, Rebecca Stowe. Three, Nicole Flores. Four, McKenna Coughlin. Five, Carmen Graves. Six, Jessica Sheriff. Seven, Lindsay Sickler. Eight, Briar Brumley. Nine, Ashley Loreno Rosado. 10, Kayla DeLay. 11, Annika Sisson, 12, Meredith Rizzo, 13, Rolanda Bell, 14, Bailey Myers, 15, Laurel Fisher, and they are off, but who brought us this race? This race was brought to you by Stephanie Garcia, who unfortunately couldn't be here to compete, but she did pass along a note. So she's a two-time, for those who aren't familiar with who Steph Garcia is, she's a two-time U.S. Uh, national team member at the IWF World Championships. She runs for Team New Balance and Furman Elite. So her message to those competing tonight and those who have tuned in was like, I would have never made it over the barriers of my career without the support of some incredibly impactful coaches at the collegiate and professional level, especially Robert Gary, whose vision for Furman Elite was to provide holistic support for athletes aiming to compete at the global level. Success occurs when opportunity meets preparation, and I'm so honored to support an opportunity for the next generation of steeple stars. Start, smart, start small, think big, y'all. Shout out to Steph. You can follow her at Steph underscore steeples on Instagram. So go show love to Steph on her Instagram. I know I, I just got a notification on my phone that she uh, just posted to her story. So she's definitely tuned in and watching this race. I love that we have athletes supporting other athletes. You know, in races that they're not even in, we have sponsors and that, you know, a beautiful thing that's happening in the sport right now that makes events like this possible, makes streaming races for free on YouTube possible. So please, if you're watching at home, give them a shout out. As we approach that first water barrier, it is Rebecca Stowe, the KU alum, now training yeah. in New York City, my former teammate at New Jersey, New York. Uh, she based in New York City. Yeah, uh, has done some coaching with uh, Nike's Project Moonshot. Uh, so a lot of people in the New York City area who might have been coached or, uh, or you know, consulted by her are probably tuned in to watch Coach in action. And so here she is, right up toward the front. Uh, she's been steepling, I believe, since like 2010. Yeah, you know, she took a little bit break, but I think she was really motivated by the idea of getting back and trying to make it to the Olympic trials in 2021. And she's got, uh, you know, obviously a ton of experience in this event. She was an All-American in college at KU. She made the final at the 2012 trials in this event. Yeah, and, you know, personal best of 9.52. So uh, when we were looking at that U.S. trial standard of 9.50, you know, we know that it's within, with, it's within reach. And so really cool to see her back at 
at, at, back at it again, you know, because you know, for a little while she was really all in on coaching, and now you can coach and run. You can do both. Yeah. When are you going to start doing that? I have a few athletes <laughs> in Hastings on Hudson. Um, no, and so the cool thing, too, is just sort of like with uh, – I, I was always going to call her Coach Stowe because that's how everyone knows her in, in New York City. But with Rebecca Stowe, it's just that uh, being in the New York City running community, she's able to, you know, pop up in distance. you got so many race opportunities with the New York Roadrunners in a number of years. So she's done some half marathons, some 10Ks. So she's got the strength. And now let's see if, how much speed she's uh, found in the last couple of months to try and get back under 10 minutes for the first time since 2015, maybe? Yeah, well, speaking of people who've been seepling for a long time in first place, that's Alicia Douglas from Colorado Springs. TC Elite, uh, you know, her personal best is 948 from 2014. And she's been steepling since 2010. She's a veteran in the event. And that's why, you know, we got two veterans up front showing yeah. us the way. And, and you know, what's really funny is the juxtaposition right there. There's Bailey Myers right behind her. Bailey, I believe, is new to the steeplechase. Yeah, um, to the but, best of my knowledge, I've never seen her steeple before. And, you know, she's in good company. Some people are going to show her the way. Yeah, so she's only steepled uh, to, w in the research that I did just once. And it was last weekend at the Drake Relay. She ran 10.20 there. First ever chance. It's a she great shared, start. She shared a photo on Instagram afterwards just kind of. Uh, about, of the you know the bumps and the bruises that came with you know her first ever steeplechase experience and she wrote that you know when I lay down at night here's what I'm proud of I'm working really hard at something important to me I'm trying something new that I'm loving and I'm building back the ability to hurt so at the Texas qualifier we saw Bailey run 422 for the 1500 she's got an 800 PR of 202 a 1500 PR of 414 so the steeplechase and see if she can catch a little bit of fire here in, in, as, as her newest event and another athlete that uh, we're seeing up near the front, uh, she's hit number 10, Kaylee DeLay. She has a personal best of 10-12, but the HEPS fans out there may recognize her as the 2019 HEPS cross champ while at Yale, uh, where she was captain. She's uh, there on the outside moving up in the headband. And, you know, 10-12, uh, you're knocking on the door of a big breakthrough right now, and hopefully she can knock out this time here tonight, get that U.S. trial standard, and, uh, Build on some momentum. Yeah, and, and again, like that 10-12 was run at the Penn Relays in April 2019. And again, a year later, you know, really not that many opportunities, none in 2020. And this time around, they've been very limited. So athletes coming out here to Kansas to try and, and, and notch PRs and qualifiers. So uh, it's a special time. And she just passed Carmen Graves, whose personal best is 947 from Sacramento in 2014. We re might recognize her from the Texas qualifier. She was there running the 1,500 meters. But she, another one, hasn't seen in a long time. But she made it to the trials in 2016, and we know that she wants to make it back there. So let's see, in the chat, who do you guys have in this race? Because it is wide open right now. You got three athletes up in the front, but you know, with, with the barriers and the hurdles, anything can happen. Meredith Rizzo there in second place from Tracksmith looking really strong, slowly moving up through the field. Her personal best is 10.07. She's the former Hoya out of Georgetown. Uh, now she's based in Boston, and she's coached by Pat McCurry of Idaho afoot. Yeah, oh, Idaho, Idaho afoot. Sorry. Idaho afoot has been sharing so much content. I think, I believe Coach drove all the way here, uh, was on a little bit of a road trip, sharing on Instagram stories, just a little bit of the uh, the journey to get out here. Uh, but you know, that's what you gotta do. That's life on the road for a track athlete and coach. So there's Kaylee DeLay making a big surge, breaking away from the pack. You know, she's starting to wind this thing up as they approach, I believe, 2,000 meters. Do I have that correct? And 6.37, the splits again are really tough. We're looking at about 78 seconds of 400 for 9.50. It's easy to get lost on the track in the yeah. steeplechase. It's normal to see the coaches taking splits from the line and every time the athletes pass, they take you know, one step forward and that's the new spot where they will now read splits from. It's very interesting to see, and it, it just might be how new she is to the event. Bailey Meyer's going very wide on the outside of, on these uh, on these water jumps, but she's still there. Um, and I guess I, I remember having this conversation with Mitch Kastoff a couple of years ago about how 
1500 meter runners tend to, you know, be good steeplechasers. And with Bailey Myers of the 414 personal best making the, the jump up to this event, I mean, were you of a similar mindset too? I mean, viewing the event, you steepled for a little bit in college and then focused solely on the 15. Yeah, so I, real quick, uh, it looked like she needs about 230 here for the final 800 meters. Something that's well within reason, a little bit faster than that 950, uh, the 950 pace a little quicker than she's been running, but she's clearly feeling good running away from the field. But to your point, Chris, I think that 1500 runners often bring an athleticism to the event. If you can train like a, a 5K athlete, but maybe have that little bit of pop in your legs, the ability to jump, uh, you know, oftentimes good steeplechasers are great in the weight room, very good at uh, cleaning, <laughs> you know, deadlifting, they're strong. And you have to be athletic if you're gonna make it over a water barrier like this. That's not for anyone. As you see, she there lands two feet. She's getting tired, but she uh, she's running in the flats well, although, you know, with about, what do we have, seven barriers left, six barriers left, you've got to be in survival mode over each and just run fast in between. So great footage there from the Hustle Clean drone. And, you know, the steeplechase is a hot event right now. I mean, just last night, we had three collegiate athletes dip under the U.S. Olympic trials uh, standard, where we had Courtney Wayman running a U.S. leading time of 9.31. Uh, but here at the Bell Lab, 8.39 with a lap to go. So she needs about a 70, 71 second. Last final 400 to really nail that U.S. trial standard. But she looks like close. it's within reach. You know, she is uh, very much, she's looking up. I'm sure coaches somewhere down on the infield yelling at her, telling her what she's got to do. And she's not waiting to the last 100. She's really starting to go here on that back straightaway. Made her move early just after the pacer had dropped out and has not let up at all. Uh, Bailey Myers in second place uh, right now, still looking strong for her second time in the event. She is applying pressure here. She is one more just water one jump. water jump. She makes it through, she survives, and now she's got to look up, come off that final bend quick. It's going to take a heroic last 100. Does she have one more round in the chamber here? It looks like she's probably going to dip under 10. A final barrier. It looks high. She makes it. That second knee gets over. It's clear running to the finish. As Bailey Myers is closing, is closing hard. super hard showing that 1500 speed, but it's going to be delay under 10 minutes. A great race for her, a great race for Bailey Myers, just a couple seconds behind. Yeah, Bailey Myers notched a big PR, chipping away again, and like 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 I mentioned before, like the, the steeplechase is going to be one of those events where uh, you could end up on the descending order list and still make it to the trials. Yeah, you know, I, I think that we often forget just how new the women's steeplechase yeah. is. It, it was, I believe, first run in the Olympics in 2008, I want to say, and um, we're seeing times drop really rapidly. Like our idea of what is a good steeple time on the women's side of things keeps getting rewritten. And I think a few years ago, the it was strong up top, but yeah. there wasn't necessarily a depth to the event that there is now. It was for a while Jenny Simpson just dominating, and then a, a little bit of a gap between her and the next best competitors. Uh, but it, here's a quick replay of how this race panned out, where. Um, at the very beginning, we had a lot of the veterans in the field uh, up towards the front. The new, the newbies, sort of. Uh, Bailey Myers was tucked in in that top three position for most of the race. And Kaylee Delay then put it on and kept this lead. Extended it for a bit, but it wasn't until the last lap, I feel like, that uh, it almost looked like uh, if the race had been 400 meters longer, Bailey Meyer was charging. Well, you know, I think for Bailey, she's running these races conservatively. Yeah. Conservatively, she's still figuring out the event. And for her, just the more she does it, the more comfortable she's going to be, the better idea of what that rhythm is supposed to feel like. The water barrier is going to be less intimidating every single time that you do it. And Kaylee is now down on the track with Aaron and Josh. So Kaylee, you really put on those burners like last three laps and really just went for it. What was going through your mind as you, you didn't feel no one around you, but you're still able to finish fast and get over those barriers? Yeah, I was just thinking, try not to slow down too much and keep going. <laughs> um, I kind of saw early on that we were like a little off pace 
for like the 950 mark and I didn't really think I could make it up but I figured I'd try so that was going through my head. You might as well you might as well try. Overhearing too they were saying it's your first steeple in two years what was it like to come out here for the opener in two years? Um, pretty scary I'm pretty horrible at the water jump as you can see in the video um, so I was a little afraid of that but um, I didn't fall, so it was a plus. So I was feeling good about that. Yeah, you never, you never want to fall. <laughs> and you were, you were up by so much. What was going through your mind when you were by yourself and you had to just push the whole way? Yeah, I was like, maybe this is a too bold of a move, but we'll see. I like could hear like you know from the water jump how close people were and stuff. But I was just thinking like try to hold the pace of running and like see how long you can do it for. Well, Kaylee, you definitely held them off. We really do appreciate you coming out here and running just great times. So put on a show. Definitely put on a show for the fans at home. Really do appreciate you, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Back to you, Chris and Kyle. Good job. Thank you. Also, just a shout out to Aaron with that Trials of Miles shirt. I don't know. When we walked in today, there were so many cool yeah, pieces of uh, clothing to pick up. Some, yeah. Some good swag. Lots of Trials of Miles gear in collaboration with Heartbreak Running Company. So check out heartbreak.run uh, to check out the shirts that I'm wearing, the one that Aaron and Josh are wearing. Uh, so here's the here's the shirt I've got. I got a... I'm cold. I got a little Trials of Miles thing. Let me flex a little. Um, so yeah, you look good. You feel good. The legs are feeling good. I got my tracksmith jumper on right now. <laughs> so um, check out heartbreak.run. Right there. That's the website. A lot of support uh, around the sport right now. Thank you, Steph, to, for sponsoring that race. I hope she enjoyed the race. I think she did. Yeah, Let's yeah, yeah. of course. Well, um, you know, things have been heating up here, Chris. I'm starting to sweat a little bit. I'm getting some nerves. I feel like I need to open up these hustle cleans. Oh right man, now. let's see, let's see. We got a, a live. Oh man. If we get back to the booth here on the camera, we might see Kyle using the hustle clean. Oh, it smells great. I know that I, it was, it's a small booth, and you're probably smelling me right now. But I might have to use it with this. I'm sweating. Too. Oh, oh I got there you, buddy. it is. I got there you. it is. That's that's some the hustle clean. Yes. Now Chris is clean. That's a GIF that's going to end up on dump flow track. Yeah, so uh, please <laughs> head over to at Hustle Clean on Instagram right now. Check out their post from today. To Enter the prediction contest for, uh, well, no, I think that event also that already happened. We already day. missed that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, we got a cool commercial for the viewers at home. Check it out. Support Hustle Clean. See what they're about. How you do anything is how you do everything. And how you do everything is how you do anything. You know, you have to give your all to being a family man. You have to give your all to being an entrepreneur. You have to give your all to taking care of yourself. No such thing as giving less than 100%. You give 100% in every facet of your life. And next on the track, we've got the men's 5K, and it is presented by the Harrier. The Harrier was founded in 2020 with the goal of creating high-quality content with apparel that is inspired by running culture, history, and current trends. So the Harrier is firm believers that there's nothing that there's more to life than dry fit running clothes, the ultra comfy running streetwear from the Harrier. You can rep the culture before and after your run. Each piece is inspired by the sports history and the latest trends. They are a one-stop shop for running content and sometimes apparel. So right now, use the promo code Kansas City and you'll get 25% off any order. Head on over to their website and check out their products. It's the Harrier. Shout out to the Harrier, one of the first people to step up and sponsor the lap count. Wow, I can't believe it's taken this long to get the first lap count plug there into, you go. The, in, into the uh, broadcast. All right, the men's 5K is on the line and they are off. One, Brian Lamas. Two, Tyler McCandl McCandless. Three, Adam Fogg. Four, Robert Warner. Five, Cooper Schroeder. Six, Thomas Pollard. Seven, Clint McKelvey. Eight, Joe Moore. Nine, Mitchell Day. Ten, Brandon Johnson. Eleven, Jordan Kyle. Twelve, James Segura. Thirteen, Tim McGowan. Fourteen, Ian Carter. Fifteen, Carlos Martin Diaz del Rio. Sixteen, Zuhair Talvi. Seventeen, John Ranieri. Eighteen, Zach Zarda. Nineteen, Jacob Thompson. Twenty, Sam Chalenga. Twenty-one, Emmanuel Rudolph. Twenty-two, Shay Foster. A late entry into the field. Yeah, 
last second, like pulled up to, to Kansas City uh, last night, actually. Got in really late, too. Got in super late with a couple teammates. Uh, from Drove up from southeastern Louisiana. So uh, before, uh, we were in the hotel lobby, and we ran into the one and only Sam Shalanga, who's up in second place right now. And he said, guys, I'm going to put on a show for you guys tonight. He did talk a really <laughs> big game. Um, and, you know, I know just the man to put on a show with him now. That's in right behind our rabbit coming back from the 1500. We have Zuhair Talby from down in Oklahoma State, that squad. He dominated that 10K at the Trials of Miles meet in Austin. And, you know, he it was like the humidity affected everyone but him. It was like he was in a different atmosphere. Just locked into one pace. It was a metronome for a lot of it. Um, he, he competes for Oklahoma City. Uh, was the real shock of that meet. Like halfway through the race, we were just like, who is this guy? Yeah, like, we're what like is he doing? on Google trying to find anything that we can about him. But since we last saw him, he's con really just continued his yeah. winning ways. He ran 13.39 at the Sound Running College Invite earlier this month. So, you know, he's already dipped under 13.40. Uh, we get to see him now in the 5K. So he's broken 13.30 uh, twice in his career. Um, his time in Austin was 28.12. Uh, for the 10K, and I remember in the interview that he did afterwards, he was saying, oh yeah, I've got the NAIA Indoor Championships just a couple days from now, and he, did, he took the 5K title there in 1344 indoors, so uh, he's, he, he's, uh, he's on one right now. Yeah, he, he, I mean, he's looking great. Uh, he, his personal best is 1329 from 2018 in Portugal, and so, uh, you know, a, a very fast track there in Belgium that we've seen some great summer races from Americans throughout our time, but they uh, they look strong, they're well strung out as they approach 1,000 meters in about 2.43. Yeah. One of the other guys to kind of watch in this race as he's tucked in around the you know top five, top six position is uh, Jacob Thompson, who recently shared that he was training and was in a workout with uh, Mo Farah. <laughs> yeah, so pretty cool. If, yeah, if any of that speed is contagious, then uh, he, he could have a good one today. So these guys are looking strong. Uh, so, Chris, we, we were speaking to Sam Schlenga yeah. early today, and we did see him down in Austin. He didn't have a, a great race, but he's feeling really confident coming in today, and part of the reason why is this is like the first time he's had a month of uninterrupted training. Right, so for the people who aren't familiar with Sam's story, one, he's got a book out, um, and he helps share a little bit of insight into just not only his career, but uh, why he decided to pursue uh, the Army, not through the WCAP program, but actually in the Army where he's, you know, doing, uh, he's training other officers, uh, and he's out there sometimes in the wilderness for four or five days uh, in the past, I think as of April 1st is the first stretch of time where he hasn't really had to, you know, be in training and scheduling, you know, uh, work uh, for for other people in his uh, in his platoon. So he shared a lot of videos with us while we were some uh, really cool stuff. Him yeah. shooting, uh, blowing things up. Yeah, uh, you know, fully decked out and lots of uh, heavy gear at times. And which we asked him sort of like in, in having to you know haul around so much gear and, and equipment. Like he probably got a little bit stronger. He said, "Oh yeah, last year his body was." Uh, the, 10 pounds heavier and a little bit stronger than, than he is now. But now he's, you know, focused in, hoping to try and make it to the trials. And he's, you know, sitting in second place right now. So our rabbit just stepped off at the mile 419. That's perfect. That's right where we want to be. We're looking at 65s for the most part. And uh, now Zuhair takes over. We know that he's not scared to lead. And it almost seems like there is an injection of pace right there as soon as he did step off, so we know that Zuhair is feeling good. Uh, the, the temperature is actually way more comfortable than before, definitely more comfortable than it was in Austin. This is kind of what it was like uh, last night, and we were a lot of us were, were hanging out outside, and it'd be like, if the beat was tonight, then it's, it would be perfect conditions. So what we're getting there right now, Sam Shalanka's PR of 13.09 in this race was set in Eugene back in 2012. Uh, crazy race, won by Mo Farah in 12.56. 
Galen Rupp was third, Kennedy Subikele was fourth, and uh, Shalenga actually ended up with a couple uh, good names that he beat in that race. We got Matt Teagan Camp, Ben True, Alistair Craig, Leonard Career, and Craig Macham, all of them in that race. And, you know, look at it, almost a decade later, still going strong. Yeah, quite quite the career that he's had. Yeah, those guys were tired. Well, so in third place, uh, you know, for those who aren't familiar, that's James Sugira. He ran a personal best of 1346, but he did that at altitude in Kampala. He's now running for Eastern Kentucky, but he represents Rwanda. Uh, he was 14th at the NCAA Cross Country Champs in 2018, so. It, he's actually one of those names, and I, 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 in Texas, I remember mentioning uh, Isaac Wood and how he compiles the Wood Report, which is, you know, projections and, and rankings and ratings of all the cross country runners. Wood Report, check it out. Uh, but on it, I remember one of my favorite questions to ask him at the NCAA championships every year is, who is a good cross country runner that we should watch on the track? And after 2018 NCAAs, he pointed out James Segura is one of those guys who's gonna light it up. And here he is. So that they came through there in, uh, I guess, 631. And they look good. They're picking it up. Uh, Zuhair is doing a lot of the work up front. Uh, in third place, hip number 15, that's Carlos Martin Diaz del Rio representing Chile. Now, his personal best is 13.59, but Chris, I think we can expect something big from him right now. Yes, and, and, and certainly, because it's funny, uh, a couple hours ago, on my way up to the track, I was checking uh, Sidious Max DMs, and we have a couple fans from Chile watching on the live stream right now, and they're like, yeah, we're watching for our, our, our athlete, Carlos Martin Diaz, and I said, well, listen, I'm gonna bring you with some Chilean uh, track facts. He's the Chilean uh, national record holder in the 1500 of 337. He won gold at the 2015 South American Championships. He's earned a bronze medal in the 5K at the 2019 Pan American Games. And, you know, he can go up to the half marathon. He's got the national record there with a 62-22 at the 2018 Valencia half. You see Zuhair uh, clicking his watch off at the laps. He is, you know, going to put this on Strava later. Another guy that is in that chase back that I do want to give a quick shout out to is Zach Zarda. He is yes. a local guy. He was one of the boots on the ground in here in Kansas. Yeah, helping do a lot of the organizing with the Trials and Miles guys and the Heartbreak Running Company. So if we needed to, you know, ship some some signage or some shirts over, it went to his place and he brought it all over to the track. So major props to Zach for his help with the meet. Huge thanks to him. And that last lap was a 63. So they, they have really started to roll and Sam is just hanging on and gonna ride Zuhair. Uh, you know, these two guys we know are super, super strong 10K guys. They're not necessarily 5K guys who need to wait till the final 400. They can make this strong push from way out. Sam is making good on his promise that he was going to put on a little bit of a show for us. So I'm very curious to see when he's going to, you know, turn on and ratchet it down even more. You know, he was saying he retired for a little bit. He said when he was retired that his magic number was seven miles a day. So yeah. he, he never completely, you know, stepped away. He was always staying in touch. And it's for reasons like this now. Uh, still, you know, talent never goes away. Who says that? I think I made that up. Talent. <laughs> Well, you're subscribing to that. You're still running about seven miles a day. Yeah, no, it's, it's dragging really, me on a run today. In the, in the, in the heat and humidity out here. It's clearly worked for Sam as they approach now four laps to go. Nine twelve. That was a another uh, sixty-three high. Now the best part about this too is that when we were talking to Sam at the very end of it, he was telling us how uh, yes, he's gotten a little bit of a break from work to focus on his training a little bit, uh, and if he hits an OTQ, that only extends uh, the break a, a little bit further. But he was like, yeah, you know, if the OTQ happens today, then that'd be great. But he's like, I really have my sights set on, on the 10K. So he's kind of using this as a little bit of a test for his speed to see where he's at maybe when he jumps into uh, the sound running meet that's coming up and, and getting back into the 10K waters there. I was kind of amazed at how little he was invested in this particular race. He really, I mean, he obviously wanted to run fast, but he saw this as a stepping stone, something that, you know, hopefully sets him up really well in a couple of weeks, I believe at Sound Running, he's gonna go for a 10K there, which is probably, you know, historically his best it's, event. Yeah. And so, Zuhair's been leading for a lot of it. Uh, 
what is what is the current? We talked a little bit about this uh, in the 5K out in Austin, but what 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 are the manners in a, in a 5K? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, if you're not feeling good, I would say don't take the lead. <laughs> but uh, you know, that lap that started to lag just a little bit, and I think if Sam senses that, he might try to just take over for even just a couple hundred meters, just to let Zuhair know that he's got some help. They're they're trying to do this together right now with. Um, as they're approaching 1,000 meters to go. And I mean, they look good. I think Zuhair is probably aware of the fact that that last lap was a little bit slow, but he, with 1K left, 10.52. So, um, you know, certainly you think another 240, that's 13.26. Sam is looking at that 13.25 mark. Zuhair, I believe, is Moroccan. And yeah. so uh, that US trial standard, not quite as important to him, but still that personal best is. I mean, he's just trying to put together a full season in a, in a, in a time that the racing opportunities have been so limited. So uh, just really good to see, and the opportunities have really popped up. As they approach 800 meters, the clock shows 11.25, and that was a 65.4. So, you know, still in that 240 range, but I think that uh, hopefully they have a little bit left and can close it down. I think he's, it looks like he's starting to put a couple meters on Sam. He is fully aware, again, wearing a watch, rare move for any non-rabbit, but he's winding it up from really far out here with 600 meters to go. It's really cool for me to see just like, now that things have gotten better and we're allowing, you know, some fans, the atmosphere has been better. We see some, some more coaches on the infield, it, like, this is Sam doesn't have a coach, so I'm like kind of wondering here. Yeah, he does uh, coach himself. He was out with uh, the WCAP guys right. for a little bit, but, but no one to yell at him. Yeah, well, I was like, who's out here yelling? And you just see a bunch of uh, other coaches stepping up and giving that encouragement. You love to see. And it's important for him to know that he's not slowing down. Zuhair is just picking it up, as that was a 60-second lap with 400 meters to go. So well within his PR, as that drone follows the him around clean the track. Drone. Hustle Clean Drone has to find another gear to keep up with him. He has fully taken control of this race once again. Now, I think NA, NAIA, you know, you, you don't necessarily expect him to join these pro races and just keep dominating the way he has, but he's clearly a talent, and I think someone we're going to be seeing much more of in the near future. With 200 meters to go, that's 12.56. So hopefully they, we can see a sub-30. The NAIA folks in the chat have you know, chimed in and said that this is, this is typical. He's done this in cross country. He's done this in track. And, and now he's out here showing it off on a couple of professional runners. He's starting to hurt. He's feeling those last 4,900 meters. But at this point, the finish is well within sight. Can he turn on the Jets one last bit as he swings into lane two? His personal Three, best of 13.29 looks like it's under attack. And he's just Ooh. barely, I think, going to rewrite his record. Uh, with a 13.28.97, great race for him. He stops his watch, you gotta love it. <laughs> Can't wait to check that one out later. Sam, 13.36, just didn't have that final gear there, with the last four meters, but again, he's thinking about the 10K, yeah. which was a and really is a strong, strong showing. Yep. That was exciting. Uh, there in third place was Thompson. 1346, I believe. He's running for Thompson training. I know he, he coaches a ton of really good athletes. And so uh, if anyone's looking, if that didn't you know, add some validity to his name, then I don't know what you're looking for. So do you have the live results pulled up? Let's, let's just see uh, what other results are we pulling in here. Yeah, let's head over to the live results. As and again, some of these people, if they miss the trials qualifier uh, or fell short of their goal, it, it, the opportunities in the States right now are great. And it's kind of like, it's a good thing to see for the sport. We've got a ton of meets on the schedule in May uh, to look forward to. And so you're gonna start to see uh, some guy, uh, like a lot of these guys double back and try and run the 10K uh, or other 5Ks later on in the month. Yeah, you know, this is just, it's a long season, uh, but things are starting to heat up here. Like we're getting to that point of the year where you really wanna demonstrate your fitness. like. 
you're you're starting to back off a little bit more in all of your races. You're not necessarily coming into quite as heavy of races, uh, quite as heavy of legs uh, as the mileage starts to come down, and you start thinking about those late season meets that are the big ones that are circled on your calendar. And right now is the time when you want to start building up that confidence. You want to be running fast and you know be in the right headspace. So great race for Zuhair. Hopefully we get an opportunity to speak with him down below. Uh, We're going to have another guest in the booth shortly. Yeah, we do. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And I think Zuhair was being followed around with someone with an iPhone. And I got to wonder, it's like in this generation where so many of the uh, uh, the younger runners are popping off with the YouTube channels, he might have one. Let's, let's, let's look out for it. But here we go. We've got the running report guys down on the sidelines with Zuhair. I think you were like right there, but Zuhair, great race, man. First off, congratulations. Charles and Miles just seeing you lucky here. You always get in the race and everything, but I'm, I'm curious. You're always going to the front. You love that lead. You love leading. What's that, What's about the leads and taking that that you like about it? Really, I don't like leading, but <laughs> it's just I don't want to risk it. I want to like go in the, in the time I want, so because I had I had some races where you're just behind and you end up uh, finishing in a slow time. So today, I, I was in shape, so I was like, I will take it. If someone want to help during the race, it's going to be good. But if it's not, I will just finish. I like that. I like that mentality. And like Joshua said, like, you really, you just come out here and you make sure you get the job done no matter what. What are the goals for the rest of the season? Uh, uh, I have one more uh, race in two, two weeks in California at 10K. Uh, I hope I will do well there. But uh, in, in IIA uh, championship, I don't have uh, outdoor eligibility, so I will just do uh, some uh, races unattached. And you're talking about that time. What is that goal time for you this year? What are you looking to run this year? What are those goal times in the 5K and the 10? Uh, I just want to improve my PRs. That's that's the goal. But for the Olympic standard, I feel like with school it's gonna be hard, and they will just stress doing doing it. So I just I want to just improve the times until uh, next year, hopefully, the World Championship. And you're really coming out here, and you repping for the NAIA schools. You know, you you won uh, before the Texas qualifier and the yeah. 10K, and then you come out here, and you beat an NCAA champion within Sam Shalanga. So what does it feel like to rep the NAIA like that? Uh, uh, it feels good, it feels good. Like, uh, I have my personal goals uh, with coach goals, like winning the NAIA, but I always, like, focus on my personal goal more often to to keep improving because if I just focus on NIA uh, sometimes it's not uh, the challenge to to keep improving so I try to do both uh, at the same time yeah, well, great job out there I really do appreciate you here great job man thank you so much back to you Chris and Kyle yo so we've got the women's 5K OTQ section on the track presented by the Road to the Trials podcast. The Road to the Trials podcast is presented by Koros, and it features six elite runners pulling back the curtains to share their training, racing, and goals in the lead-up to the U.S. Olympic Trials in June. On that podcast, hosted by Matt Chittum, you can hear Kira D'Amato, Dana Giordano, Olivia Baker, Tyler Day, Frank Lara, and Abe Alvarado. You'll learn more about these incredible athletes, and you can find the Road to the Trials podcast wherever you get your shows, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, tune on in. And we are joined in the booth with a special guest, Katie Follett. How are you? 15.04 5K runner. It seemed appropriate to bring you in for this women's OTQ 5K. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm not going to lie. It feels really good to be at a track meet right now. It does. It, it feels normal a little, right? The excitement, the heart pumping. You know, I wish I was out there racing myself um, because it's just, it's, it feels great. But why aren't you racing? What's going on? Well... I uh, recently moved back to Colorado, got remarried this last October, and then surprise, surprise, the beginning of this year, 
I found out that I am going to actually be having a baby in September. So Congratulations. I've changed my timeline for this year a well, little bit. I'm glad that you're then in the booth with us tonight. Obviously, huge congrats. Thanks. Um, let's run through the field real quick, Chris. Section, uh, the women's 5,000 meter run, OTQ. One, Jen Bergman. Two, Tansy Listad. Three, Jessica Judd. Four, Nell Rojas. Five, Maddie Ahm. Six, Emma Wilson. Seven, Angie Nickerson. Eight, Natalia Hawthorne. 9, Laura Galvin, 10, Chelsea Burns, 11, Taylor Werner, 12, Alexandria Cruz, 13, Julianne Stolle, 14, Risper Gesso Kwa, 15, Joyce Camelli, and 16, Georgia Porter. The U.S. trial standard, you see it on the screen, is 1520, and the Olympic standard is 1510. So in this race, a lot of eyes will be on Joyce Camelli, who is the NCAA champion indoors and her outdoor PR of 1606.50 set back in May of 2019 is likely going down because she ran 15.48 to win the NCAA indoor title which was Auburn's first NCAA track and field champion since 2010 so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how well she runs here today. And 400 meters through in 71 seconds on our rabbit Leanne Farber is Jessica Judd who I was very excited to see in this race. It's yeah. She's been, she's been at a high level since being a teenage sensation out of the UK. And so, uh, yeah, the 5K is the event. I thought for a while she was going to be a 1,500 meter specialist, but now has really taken well to, to the 5K. So, Katie, early parts of a 5K, what's it going through these athletes at? You know, I think in the early part of the 5K, you're just trying to stay as relaxed as possible um, and kind of settle in to that, to that pace, while also you really want to be aware of what's going on as well you always um that it like, becomes more important as the race goes on but you want to be aware even early on in the race of any gaps that are forming that you might need to cover um and i think it's easy early on in a 5k to also get too excited so you know you just don't want to <laughs> start going up um, ratcheting down that pace too soon yeah so you always kind of approach the event from more of a 1500 background is the early laps of the 5K feel really comfortable because it's a little bit slower of a cadence, or are you like, wow, I have so much to go? I think it depends on the day. <laughs> you know, we've all had those races where you get out there and you just feel amazing from the gun and you're kind of chomping at the bit. And then you have those days where you get out there and you can tell, okay, this is gonna be a little bit of a grinder today. Um, and I think, you know, that's where it comes down to just trusting your training, trusting your coach, trusting what you're capable of running and really being committed to that. Now, in your experience, what kind of uh, training difference is there between a 1500 and a 5K? Did you have to really make a big jump up in mileage, way more tempo work? What, what was the, the changes that were happening on that side? You know, I always, um, the 5K and the 1500 training that I've done in have all, always been pretty compatible. But I think with the 1500, there's a lot more emphasis on speed, especially that a really high-end speed, 150s. Stuff like that, whereas in the 5K, obviously, having that aerobic base and that mileage uh, is, is more important. So we just saw them come through the first K in 303. Obviously, really even pacing makes such a, a large difference over the course of such a long race, right? Like, would you rather a positive split, negative split? Do you want to run as evenly as possible? I think it depends. Um, for me, I've always ran I've always ran better in the 5K if I'm negative splitting a little bit. So I was kind of curious because you're one of these athletes who has, you know, focused on the 15 5K, and when it comes to the trials, you in the past have been able to put your chips into both baskets, mm -hmm. and this time around, now it, the schedule just doesn't allow for it. Like an athlete yeah. has to be all in on the 1500, all in on the 5K. It's May 1st right now. Is, when does a decision like that sort of have to be made in this unusual circumstance that we have on our hands where you want to bring that A game to just one event this time around? Like, do you think like someone can make that decision a month from now or can they still, is, is that something they have to commit to this early on? I think they probably could make, you know, when I've been trying to decide between the 15 and the 5K, I have decided pretty late in the game, up to a, a month before. Uh, but I think it really depends on the athlete's training. I mean, I, I coming into this year, I just decided 
I love the 15. The 15 is where my heart's at. I really want to focus on high end speed. Um, and so I backed off a little bit of, on mileage and I backed up in intensity, you know, in prep. I was like, I'm going into this year with the intention of the 1500. So I think it's really a decision that um, will come down to what the athlete and the coach want to do. But I, I think there's not necessarily a wrong way. And, and there's a lot of women who are probably doing it um, in, in, in both ways. Yeah, so we just saw them come through in 453 for that first 1600 meters. Our rabbit, Leanne Farber, stepped off and now Judd's up front. On her heels is Julianne Stelly from yeah. uh, Canada, sponsored by New Balance. She ran an unbelievable two mile race indoors at Ocean Breeze. It was a 922. Uh, so she looked great at the Texas qualifier. That was her personal best at 1532. The conditions a lot better really today. Yeah. So, you know, I think that maybe speaks to her potential of what we might see tonight. And another person who ran well at the Texas qualifier is Laura Galvin, who's a little bit further back now, around fifth place. And so keep your eyes on her. She won the 1500 and then doubled back to run the 5K the next day. So she's still in the conversation in the mix right now, early on. And then in third place, we see our NCAA champ, Joyce Camelli. Uh, you know, having the opportunity to sit on some seasoned veterans, some pros, and just, you know, hopefully tonight, I think she's going to destroy her personal best. I'm feeling yeah. she's going to be quite good at the 5K. Uh, Something tells me that. At the back of that first leaders pack is Maddie Alm, who's training out in uh, Boulder, but I guess like uh, she's with Joe Beauchart's group and Emma Coburn. Uh, and so they've been up in Crest Butte, I think, for the past couple weeks, really at 9,000 feet, which sounds just so brutal to train. Like even easy runs must feel difficult out there. She sent a really nice note last time after we gave her a shout out on the broadcast because uh, she's got her own sports nutrition and consulting service called Fueling Forward. And so, uh, check her out you, you know she's uh just generally super super nice person so a uh, really cool story about our athlete fourth place risper gazaba she's uh competed for kenya up until 2018 but she first went to mexico for a race in 2011. yes i remember when i was doing the research for this i oh, found okay. it totally Ten, fascinating you got, you're you, reading you're reading my notes you Kyle. ordered the big salad <laughs> No, but yeah, it, it's interesting because like, you know, there's a bunch of immigration issues right now where, you know, uh, foreign athletes can come to the United States and then find themselves in a holding pattern uh, for way too long and not being able to represent, uh, you know, the United States if they wanted to. Uh, so there's some athletes who have gone down to, to Mexico, stayed down there, trained down there, run some races in the United States, and she's one of them and is now representing Mexico internationally. So that was a 75-7, that last 400. They've slowed just a little bit. I mean, Judd has been up front the whole time. Katie, what's that burden like to lead in a 5K, maybe as opposed to a 1500? A little bit more uh, pressure now. Yeah. Um, and especially once the uh, pacer drops off, it is hard to really keep that pace going. This is the t part of the race where, you know, they're going to start feeling that grind a little bit more. And, um, you know, I think this is where really the trust comes in. It's scary to run a 5K because that pace is fast and it's a, it feels fast even when you're working out, even when I'm in my best shape. 5K pace still feels hard. And so thinking of going out there and, um, and, and doing that, you know, you, it's always, for me, it's always kind of like, okay, one more lap at this pace, one more lap at this pace. Yeah, so I guess right now, how are you feeling in this approach to motherhood right now? How do, how do the runs feel? One more lap of this race. One more lap of this race. <laughs> and so that was another 75. Um, she's been consistent, and they're going to be within striking distance. Uh, Julie's right on her, looking really, really strong. And Laura Galvin, again, she's back. Now, the question for both of you, I guess, when you guys have both run, 5K is, you know, 1,500 meter specialist. Like, when do you really start to think, like, okay, I've got this speed and this extra gear that maybe I could pull a fast one on, on the rest of the competition? I never got to that point. <laughs> this might be a question for <laughs> Katie. Um, well, I've done it uh, <laughs> too early and blown up in the last 400, and then I've timed it pretty well and ran a huge split in the last 400 out of nowhere. I think, you know, that's the exciting thing about racing is – you have to take risks sometimes and you really have to just read your body and sometimes it's going to pan out and sometimes it's not but I, I think I don't know Kyle you reach this point in the race and you can you can tell you're like 
all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's there. It's I'm, there I'm, or it's not there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they just came through 3K 917. So they're looking at like a high 1520s type pace right now. Uh, but Julianne Staley just took over the, the lead and Laura Galvin followed. Just Judd obviously reattaching immediately. Now he's finally breathe a little bit. Doesn't yeah. have to do all the work. And I guess that's huge for her when, you know, you get that mental burden off and you can just focus on, you know, recomposing and hopefully gearing up for a strong finish. Were you a big share, like, of the lead when it, when it came to running a 5K, or did you always just try and sit back and, you know, let someone else do the work? Well, I think I was really fortunate to have teammates yeah. um, where we could work together some of the time, because it definitely is nice, and it definitely um, it definitely breaks it up. There is really nice things about running in the lead as well. You have a lot of confidence when you're out there, and sometimes I think... Uh, running with other women behind you and having that little bit of extra pressure and running scared. I've, I've also run, raced really well that way. Yeah. Um, At USA's, like the final sort of like lap uh, with, you know, team spots sort of on the line. As someone who's, who's made a team, like what does that pressure sort of feel like? Because, you know, I think athletes are starting to, you know, enjoy the fact that we've got fans in the stands here and the atmosphere gets a little yeah, bit better. Yeah, atmosphere so different. But yeah, I guess like take us through like what it, could you have imagined what that last lap would have been like without any bends? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard because I only got a chance to race a couple of yeah. times last year, but it, it definitely, I am someone who feels off, um, fuels like off the energy of the crowd. Well, I mean, and I hated it, that's why I retired. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really different. Um, and also, you know, just when you see other people running fast, I know that throughout the pandemic that a lot of times they would space the races out so far that you wouldn't even be able to watch the other competitors. Like, no one else was allowed inside the track area. Yes. And, uh, you know, just being able, as you're warming up, as you're doing strides, and you're seeing other people celebrating personal bests, like, that energy really resonates with you and helps you build your adrenaline. I want to bring your attention now to the track as Laura Galvin has taken the lead. Uh, her, her, her personal best in this event is 15.27 set at uh, Azusa. Uh, I believe that was the Brian Clay Invitational back in 2019. Uh, so like I said before, she won the 1500 at the Texas Qualifier in the Friday night session and then uh, doubled back to run the 5K at the Texas Qualifier where she ran 15.28, so just a little bit shy of her personal best. In the time since then, she ran a five. She went back down to Mexico, ran a 5K there as a tune-up for this. Uh, 15:36 was the result there, and then just last week, is really, put, you know, getting herself out there and mixing in with some really tough competition. She ran 4:09:09 uh, at the Drake Relays in the 1500 to finish just behind Josette Norris, Rachel Schneider, and Shannon Wosika. And That's some good company to have. So with two laps to go, Laura is approaching in 12:52, 12:53. That was a 70-second lap, and she's ranked 35th in the world in the 5K. So while we see that Olympic standard of 15-10, this is really going to help her case. The more races you get at uh, a, a quick tempo like this, you know, she's obviously on pace to set a personal best. That's going to be worth a ton of points and hopefully going to be enough for her to get to the Olympics representing Mexico in the 5K. So two laps, less than two laps to go now. She is fully clear away from the field with 600 meters to go. Her stride, you know, she's showing that she's run a 1500 before. Like, we are no longer in that comfortable 5K, you know, 74s. We are going to see some sub 70s here, I think, in this final two laps. Form looks great right now. She looks Kate, really strong. Yeah, Katie, I guess, like, what mental, like, uh, what are you telling yourself mentally to just maintain that form? Because I look awful in the last, like, lap of the race. <laughs> you know, I think that there's certain cues that every runner um, gets from their coach that just stick. And, you know, uh, one coach can tell you the cue one way, one coach can tell you the cue one way, and, and you can hear it completely differently. And so um, some things I always focus on in the end is making sure that my, my cadence is, yeah. is quick. So, you know, staccato, staccato, you won't be on the ground too long. So but. that was a 69-second last lap. She came through with 400 meters to go in 14.03. So, I, you know, I, I didn't think she was running quite that fast. That Olympic standard is truly fully in range right now. As she approaches uh, the 200 meter mark, we're going to take a look at the clock and see if she's got a good shot here. 
I think we're trying to just establish recurring characters on the Trials of Miles circuit because she won in Austin, Sue Hare won in Austin. Uh, we had another winner earlier tonight who also had a win uh, in Austin. So it's like, yeah, this is just the recurring characters on the YouTube channel. The shoot's 1437 with 200 meters to go. Her form is not breaking down. She looks fully composed as she's trying to slingshot over some of these other athletes that she's passing now. She's swung into lane two. She sees the clock. She knows that that 15-10 barrier is going to be close. This is a huge breakthrough. The crowd is on their feet. They're rooting for her. It's going to be dangerously oh, so close. close. Come on, come on. Just over. Still an unbelievable run. Wow. I believe 15-11.3, a huge breakthrough. I think this is going to help her ranking enough that it hopefully is uh, a ticket. You know, obviously getting that 15.09 would have been nice, but she's got so uh, much left in the tank. 16 second personal best. Wow. And Julie there in second feeling. place, 15.24 with the personal best of her own. I mean, again, plenty of race opportunities coming on up. So like, it's uh, she, she she's chipping away at the right time. She's looking really great. I mean, she did a lot of work there in that second half. Um, I'm excited to hear uh, her speak with the Potts brothers down below because I'm sure that uh, that being so close a little bit bittersweet, but you've got to be excited. Yeah, especially with a 16 second PR. Yeah, you can you can never be upset with anything that big. <laughs> So here is her. I mean, just took command of the race with a thousand meters to go and never let up. Yeah. So you're looking you at her ranking right now. She wants it. And she's like, oh, the one second, but so, so close. She's going to be, I uh, just looked at the ranking. So the way that it works is they take your top three point totals and you know, that's based off of how competitive the meet was, how fast it was. And right now, her third performance in that ranking was the 15.35 from Pan, the Pan Am Games. And so, you know, you're, you're dropping a 15.35 down to a 15.11. And, you know, that's really going to boost her ranking quite a bit. So she was 35th. We'll see. We'll crunch the numbers or we'll let someone else do it and see where she ends up. Exciting. So Katie, do you want to reveal to us, I guess, like any picks you've got for the the trials, and especially in the 15 in the, in the 5K uh, this year? It's gonna it's it's gonna be crazy. Oh man, I'm just so excited to watch. I think that that is the most exciting thing about watching the Olympic trials is that it's not predictable, and there's always dark horses coming out of nowhere, and there's always the favorites, but then there's always big upsets. Yeah. You know, you never know what's gonna happen, and so. Um, it, it, that's the magic. Anything can happen. You've got too many friends. You don't want to name any names here. I get it. It's okay. <laughs> well, Katie, thank you so much for, for joining us in the booth. Uh, we're going to toss it over now to Joshua and Aaron on the sidelines. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. Bye. But Laura, Hi. join us now. You ran a really great race, number three all time for Mexico. You're just right outside of that Olympic standard, but you still ran a super great race. You're having a super good season. We got to talk to you at Sound Running as well. Just what's going through your mind right now after that? Man, <laughs> it's, you know, I think I love the sport because of this. Because how it is so great in the fact that you never know what to, you know, you're doing your best every time, but you never know what's going to come up. So I love that, and I feel like it just makes me feel like so, you know, man, so many things come up to my mind, but I think uh, it's just important, you know, keep working hard, and, and if I keep working hard, I, I know it will happen because I've, I have like 20 years of experience in this, so. You know, I, I think it's important to have that. And man, and like today it was just so close, but at the same time I know that I'm that close and when the time comes, I will do it and it will feel just amazing. You're the real deal. That's a real confidence builder for sure. I feel like every time me and Joshua see you run, whether it's at sound running or at trials or miles, you're coming so close to a PR, so close to a record. You broke that, you have that 1500 meter record. And I think you're gonna get that 5K, that 5K record as well pretty soon. But what are what are some of the big goals? Cause I feel like you are, you're a world-class athlete with these times. You continue to prove it with the 409, with the 1510, and you're gonna be up there competing. But what are, what are your biggest goals for this year? Yeah, well, 
right now I'm trying to get the standard, the Olympic standard in the 5K is my main goal. I'm trying to do 1500 and probably move up to the 10K, who knows? Just uh, because, you know, I think that it prepares me really well for the 5K. So that's the primary goal right now and uh, we'll see. Uh, uh, for now, I just really want to get that standard. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Laura. You truly are inspiring a lot of people, and we love to see you run. Me and Aaron, we love to see you run, like, honestly. You get hyped every job. time. We really do. <laughs> thank you. And the men's 3,000 meter is off. This is the Olympic section. In lane one, Don Cabral. Two, Ahmed Jaziri. Three, David Goodman. Four, Ryan Smeaton. Five, Jermaine Coleman. Six, Adam Vizoke. Seven, Mario Bazan. Eight, Brian Barraza. Nine, Craig Nowak. 10, Mike Lee. 11, Ricardo Estremera. 12, John Gay. 13, Travis Mahoney. 14, Isaac Opdyke. 15, Mark Parrish. 16, Brian Schrader. I know we do have a few scratches, but Chris, who's bringing us this race tonight? So this race is brought to you by Sarah Vaughn Realty. So Sarah Vaughn is going to be competing in the steeplechase in the uh, next race. And if you're watching this race and you live in the Boulder area, that's right, again, we're really uh, spreading our wings here with you know, all the ground we're covering. If you live in the Boulder area and you're thinking about buying or selling a home, you gotta call Sarah. She's a real estate advisor with Sotheby's International Realty, luxury service at any price point in Boulder, Colorado, specializing locally and connecting globally. She uh, actually sold Drew Hunter his house. Wow, So uh, cool. Someone, if you're in the Boulder area, check her out. Someone in this group chat is gonna move to Boulder. <laughs> Boulder real estate is so hot right now as they make it through that first water jump and it looks like uh, we have our rabbit sailor. He's back for more and is Brian Barraza sitting on him in second place. Up front, uh, I believe, is that a rabbit as well, Chris? Do we have any word on that? It, I think it might be. He's not on our sheet, so. Uh, so Sailor was rabbiting the first race. So. And he is once again checking his watch, so I have a feeling he is another. Again, one of the common themes in this race is that some of these athletes are here for a do-over. There was a race at Eastern Kentucky that was about 50 meters short. Uh, Craig Nowak actually was the winner of that race, and he ran, let me pull it up here. I had it in my notes. 821. He ran 821, was super thrilled, Olympic qualifier. Got so many congratulations on that Instagram post. Everyone was really happy. And then learned him. a couple hours later that it was 50, uh, 50 meters short. Thankfully, the meet organizers for that one said, hey, we're sorry for, for the inconvenience. We're going to pay for your travel to come out to uh, this meet. And so now, hopefully, it's hashtag OTQ for real this time. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we know that he's fit. And we were talking to him yesterday with the Beer Mile guys on the, the pre-show. Just winning that race and beating that field gave him a ton of confidence. And even if, you know, you add five seconds to that time, that's still a personal best. So, you know, he knows that he's here today to compete. And that uh, US trial standard of 832 is definitely on his mind. But still, that Olympic standard of 822, you know, he, he wants that. He wants some redemption. Up towards the front of the race right now, you got the two Tin Man Elite guys working together. Uh, you've got Brian Barraza and Jermaine Coleman. They were also in that race uh, out in Eastern Kentucky. So they are spread out well in the field. Somewhere in the middle, you see him in that tracksman singlet. That is the two-time Olympian Don Cabral. And Don, my friend, former training partner and roommate, has been looking great in training. He is very, very strong right now. And he's someone who I think is going to benefit immensely from having this one year you know, addition to the Olympic cycle because he was doing his uh, JD MBA program up at UConn, was, you know, obviously studying and working hard, and now he can focus a little bit more on just running. Uh, he looks great, and I, I got high hopes for him right now. Yeah, and if he continues with the uh, trend of, win of winners from the Trials of Miles events having success here tonight, then uh, he's in for a good one. He's won. He's competed at every single Trials of Miles meet, whether it's the one out in uh, New York City, Texas, now this one. Next year, we're going to be naming uh, a race after him. Yeah, sure. we, we did uh, see him, I believe, coming second in that 5K down in Austin to Craig Engels, yep. both just outside of Galen Rupp's high school 5K PR. But, you know, 
closed really hard. And for Don, I think the steeple, that's his bread and butter. He knows this event. And, uh, as they approach the mile in, somewhere in that high 430s range again, really hard to get the splits with the, the water barrier. Uh, you know, making it about 395 meters, but they uh, are pacing well. Brian Barraza up front, he wants that, wants to salvage that 50 meter short race and show that that wasn't a fluke, that that is in him. The thing about Don Cabral is that you could just never count him out. Right now he's sitting in the middle of this pack. He's a big strength runner. Last year, I think he took the off year to really hone in on that 5K speed. He ran the two fastest 5Ks of his career. Uh, and now that the steeple opportunities are, are coming back, he's, uh, you know, he, I, I was a little surprised that he wasn't at the one in Eugene because he decided to put his cards into, into this one. But uh, he's the one that a lot of people might be having their eyes on. It's like, okay, when Don makes the move, I'm going to go too because, I mean, the guy's been in two Olympic finals before. Yeah, well, another guy on our screen right now that looks very, very easy, very smooth, composed is Ryan Smeaton in the, uh, from the Oklahoma going State. Nuts for him. Yeah, he's got plenty of fans, rightfully so. He's run 827 in May of 2019 out at Stanford. He was second at the NCAA champs. He had a great cross country season. He was he finished 26th. So that uh, that strength carrying over from the the fields of cross country to the track and hopping hurdles. So Brian Barraza still up front as we approach two laps to go. It looks like we're gonna be requiring quite a close to get the Olympic standard time, but that Olympic trials qualifying time as they go 622 with 800 meters go, very much within reach right now. Looks like we might get a big pack of guys to get there. David Goodman is up there in the, in, in the top group right now. So Lee Troop was tweeting about this uh, this beat and this run uh, a couple days ago. Really looking forward to it. And then on the outside in the Eastern Kentucky jersey is Ahmed Jaziri. He's got an 835 personal best. He's representing Tunisia. And he finished sixth at the NCAA champs in the 3K. So, you know, not not too long ago from now, we know he's fit. And he was second in that race in Eastern Kentucky. So, like, yeah, literally was maybe like the top five guys from that or like here, like, all right. This one is hopefully going to be 3,000 meters. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think we're we're certainly getting the three K here tonight. And again, huge pack. Don Cabral hanging off the outside of Michael Leak's shoulder. Uh, they they are looking good, but now is Smeaton up front as they approach the bell lap. We're looking at 728, 729. As the pace picks up, let's hope that everyone has enough room to get over these hurdles and does so smoothly. This is when fatigue starts to kick in and all of a sudden that form starts breaking down. That toe hangs, you don't get it up. And uh, more than ever, you've got to focus on that hurdling form to make sure you're kicking fast without toe. So there he goes, Smeaton just got passed by John Gay. His personal best is 8.23, which he ran out in Eugene. Just so he's fresh off that personal best. Uh, Canadian, 24 years old, dropped that PR from 8.28 to 8.23, beat the likes of Stanley Kabene, Michael Jordan, and Haran Lagat. As they come out of Woo! the final steeple water pit, we've got Goodman up front, but we've got four guys. Ahmed this is, is racing. There. Smeaton is there. We got four guys jumping a hurdle all at once. They're all over cleanly, and now it's going to come down to who wants it most, but it's Ahmed Jaziri. Smeaton's hot on his heels, but he might be running out of real estate as Ahmed gets through to the line. 832, looking strong. Wow, That's a what PR an for him. exciting night of races we've had here, Chris. You know what I love about that is just that the very, like coming off of that that, that last barrier, it just sort of like they have the, the split second stop and it's like, who can get that gear back again? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that it's so important to be in and out of that water pit fast. And we're gonna go to that replay, show that water yes. pit. You see Goodman got a quick step on him. He wasn't able to grab uh, that was able to run away from, you know, those guys swung outside. Jaziri had that last 50 meters, came off that like a 400 hurdler. Smeaton hot on his heels, but just didn't have enough room to get him. And some redemption there from Ed Jaziri as he uh, wins the 3,000 meters.
Don Cabral, I believe, is back in seventh place in 840. So it is May 1st here. I'm thinking that everyone, uh, you know, as you're trying to get your Olympic trial standard, we're gonna start to see some people scrambling. They're gonna be traveling all over the country, taking any opportunity that they can have. Um, you know, I would say uh, the ideal schedule is you have two or three races left before the Olympic trial, three maybe steeplechases left, but you're gonna run as much as you have to <laughs> until you're under that. There's Jaziri all smiles after that victory. And props from a coach. Is that Zuhair there? Zuhair to leave. He's trying to get him to go for a cool down. <laughs> Give him a moment to That was really exciting. And Chris, I cannot believe we are basically at our final race of the night. I know. All good things must come to an end, though. And well, then we've got another meet, though, on May 21st. Yes, we do. We do. The Trials of Miles New York City qualifier, again, with the help of Heartbreak Runco, is coming to you live on the Sidious Mag YouTube channel. And so, you know, that men's 3,000 meter steeple chase is sponsored by Sarah Vaughn. I have a feeling we're gonna see her in just Very a shortly. Sarah Vaughn, the latest guest on the Sidious Mag podcast, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Anchor, wherever you get your shows. You get to hear about her career, which like, I asked her if she divides into chapters uh, with babies because she's a mother of four. And, you know, that's four breaks from running because her first kid she had while she was at Colorado back in 2006. So really on paper, her age, which she's about to turn 35 in just a couple weeks, the reason I know that is because she brought up the fact that she wants to try and run the uh, master's record in the steeplechase, which is, she said, 9.33. And we're going to... Well, uh, I'll, I'll fill you guys in on a little bit more on Sarah Vaughn first. We're going to cut to trackside right now as Brian Barraza has joined the running report guys on the sidelines. Hey, Brian, may have not been the race that you were looking for. Can you just take us through it real quick and just how what you were thinking during the race? Well, I was thinking that every race is a collection of good decisions. And from the gun, I knew my, my first good decision was going to be getting on the pacer, not letting this be a race where everybody sits and, and has to kick really hard to, to try and get under a time that all of us are capable of running. So the whole race was just, all right, I need to keep on it. I need to keep on it. I need to press here. I need to nail this hurdle here. And that's how it shook out. And those last couple of laps, they did start pressing. They oh, definitely yeah. did. And what does it mean to just have these opportunities that the Trials of Miles have been putting on? I've seen you and your teammates have been at a lot of these. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic opportunity. I'm so grateful for everybody that puts on this meet. I know that meet directors in general don't get a lot of the thanks they, they deserve, but like really giving us the stage to come out here and do what we do, so undeniably grateful for it. I know everybody on my team feels the same. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you. And the steeple is looking really good this year in the U.S. And there's a lot of fast guys, and you're definitely somebody that's going to be in the conversation. Just what's your mindset going into the trials this year? My mindset is, like I said earlier, one good decision. That one good decision may be the thing that gets me into the final, maybe the thing that gets me on the team. Hey, I like that. I like, I like that, that. I like that too. Hey, back to you, Chris and Kyle. Great, great job, bro. Appreciate you guys. Kind of race going. All right, now we've got the women's steeplechase popping off here presented by Kingston Family Vineyards. They're longtime fans of track and field and cross country. They especially love the steeplechase. So they stepped up and were like, hey, you know what? We're going to support the women's steeplechase race tonight and hopefully see some of these new qualifiers out in Eugene. So, you know, head on over to the Kingston Family Vineyard Instagram. Throw them some love on their latest post and, and thank them for sponsoring this race. So the women are off in the 3,000 meter steeplechase. The Tokyo target time is 9.30, which is the fastest personal best in the field from Amy Pratt uh, over here. And she did that in September in 2020. She ran 9.30, and she was third at the British National Championships in 2019. Um, you know, she represented them in Doha, and she opened up at the Drake Relays 
just uh, was at last week in 9.35. So we know she's fit and ready to go. Second place in that race to Leah Fallon, which is, you know, some of the women in this race are looking to try and hit that, that trials qualifier. Really, if they do, I, you know, we've looked at the women's steeplechase in the United States as like a big three right now. It's it's Emma Coburn, Courtney Frerichs, Colleen Quigley have had those top three spots since 2016, but it's the Olympic year, anything can happen, and who knows who could really pop, pop a good one off. Leah Fallon is trending in the right direction. Now let's see if there's someone who can enter sort of that conversation here tonight. So, um, you know, I think the big thing is that the steeplechase is the sort of thing where fitness is obviously not the only limiting factor. It's the ability to jump hurdles and do it smoothly. I know that Sarah Vaughn, it's been a long time since she's done that, and every time I've watched her jump over a hurdle on our screen, I, uh, I'm thinking how weird it must be for her to be back in this event. Yeah, I, I, I said to her, I called it the ultimate rust buster, and she kind of agreed. She actually bought a steeple to put in her backyard uh, and her kids have, you know, confused it with like a balance beam. And so uh, she's she's getting the training in any way she can. She's coached by by her husband. Uh, she's looking to make her first national team uh, since making the 2017 World Championship squad in the 1500. Yeah, I think uh, the, the steeple is very much something that you need to get reps in. You, yeah. you need to do it in practice. You need to always be jumping hurdles. It's so particular, the number of drills and the flexibility that you need to do. And as you know, your training shifts from being the 1500 runner that she was, now looking back to the steeple chase, those little things uh, you know, become a huge part of your routine once again. And she's like, she's up there right now in the mix. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I think this is the perfect race for her to open up. Um, you know, her personal best is right within this range of many of the ladies in the field. And therefore, you know, she doesn't have to do all the work. She can follow some other people. And I bet halfway through the race, she'll start to feel a little bit more comfortable once she can see the finish line. But uh, there, right behind our rabbit is Marissa Howard. Yeah. Uh, so she's, you know, I think on her Instagram, I believe when I was doing my research, describes herself as a school nurse by day, steeplechaser by night. And she is also a 1500 meter specialist. She's run 4, 12, 62, finished second at the 2020 USATF Road Mile Championships at 432. Uh, so again, like you said, one of those people who's getting those reps in right now. And we saw her uh, come in second at the 2020 Road Mile Champs. Yeah. And, you know, she's someone that, as we have said multiple times tonight, like having that athleticism and being a successful miler really does translate to 3K. Um, you know, people kind of approach it from two different ways. And I think uh, oftentimes it's easy to be just a, a really fast runner, someone who's athletic, and then adding that strength component and really finding a way to extend your abilities. Because it's the sort of race where if you can close hard and if you get over the hurdles smoothly, the difference between uh, you know, 10, 15 seconds in just finesse yeah. can be made up, and uh, that's why you see a lot of milers move up and try the race. So right in second place right now, that's Lizzie Bird, who ran 9.30.13 in Doha at the World Championships. I think we've got two-thirds of the British national team from that championships. Uh, she was the runner-up at the British uh, national championship that year. Opened her season with a 9.17 for 3K in Manchester. That might have been last week. We had a couple British athletes who made the trip across the pond over here uh, just in, in the past couple days. So Marissa Howard coming through the mile in somewhere in that 4.59 range. Um, you extrapolate that, we're looking at about 9.37 3K pace right now. So well under that US trial standard and seems like she's probably eyeing that Olympic standard. So Marissa, she was second at the Pan Am Games representing the United States in 2019, and then she got to go over to Belarus and do that very cool match, uh, the, yeah, the that's right. Europe versus the USA, and so she has some international experience. And uh, again, like in the last normal season, 2019, she was steepling a lot. Like she knows this yeah. event very well. Um, she's now way out in front by about 15 meters with three laps to go. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who's 
really challenging in that chase pack. This gap is growing. I always think of, you know, you make it to the Olympic trials and then you have to run two rounds there. You know, yeah. the, the 3K, it's tough to, uh, to rebound off of a lot of time. Like, it does beat your body up way more than a 1500, but even a 5K, like all of this pounding, the jumping, and especially the water pit, you're very vulnerable to injury. And to be a steeplechaser, you have to have quite the resilient body. You need to be generally an athlete who has smooth form and can put together long blocks of healthy training. Like someone injury prone, is, they're gonna have a hard time in the steeplechase. All it takes is one weird foot plant and uh, you know, things start to hurt. Yeah. So shout out to Marissa for just, you know, having that longevity and to, you know, obviously showing her experience. She wants to be back representing the United States, break into that conversation of who, who's going to be the big three. And we were saying this about the hurdles earlier in the day. The steeple is the same thing. Anything can happen on that day. The rankings really go out the window because all it takes is one bad, unlucky hurt. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, Emma Coburn and Courtney Frerichs likes to command it from the front, but then from there, yeah, one bad tumble on a water barrier could, could you know, maybe shatter someone's hopes. It is a race. Well, we don't want to jinx it, right? Now. Yeah, yeah. But it is a race it's that possible. you rarely yeah. see go tactical because, first off, there is a big advantage by leading. You know, in a 1500, not necessarily a huge advantage to be in the front, but in the steeple, you have your path through the water pit, and you get to visualize every single You don't have to worry about the approaches. person being too close to you and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, and then oftentimes the best athletes in the field want the race to go quick because if there is a small pickup, they want to be able to recover, and you don't want to necessarily wait to, you know, Emma Coburn's not going to wait to the final barrier to break away from the field because for her, she wants to assert her dominance early and let it go quick. Amy Pratt really has made up ground here and is clawing back. Marissa Howard is going to need a strong final lap to hold her off. They look very strong right now, and that Olympic standard is well within reach as they hit a bell lap with 8.14 on the clock. So they just have to basically keep doing what they're doing. They've been running this pace, and if uh, Amy can get up there, get under that standard, that's going to be quite nice for her bid to Tokyo. Really going to the arms and the head. You see bobbing up a little bit in second place. Right now, you're just thinking barrier to barrier. You're, you're breaking up mentally. Run quick through the, this straightaway, and then just survive over the hurdles. That's what it's about. You see Marissa's getting through the hurdles, but maybe a little bit smoother than Amy, but Amy's running those, uh, those fresh straightaways probably a little bit quicker yeah. in the tempo. One more water barrier up and over the heartbreak. We've got run sign. And one more barrier so just stands in her way from the victory. With 100 meters to go, it's Marissa Howard's race to lose. The crowd is on their feet. They're applauding something. It's going to be close as she makes it through that final barrier. She's got nine seconds on the clock to get there. It's going to be dangerously close. She's going to finish just outside, painful, but a beautiful race for her. Super, super impressive, doing it the hard way up front. And I believe that is a personal best. Great race for her. Oh, her previous personal best was 930.9, so just, just missed. But really a, a great way to close out this evening. Here's tonight. Sarah Vaughn coming through. I mean, big time rust buster here. Coming back to the event for the first time since 2014. She's gonna be glad to have this one under her belt moving forward. Huge thank you to everyone in the chat right now who's been sticking with us throughout the evening. This was really fun, I mean. Look at the look at how hard the athletes put it out there. You know they really left everything on the track. This is what you want to see after a steeple. Yeah. But, you know that's the thing. It's like you want to empty the tank because you can always walk a victory lap. <laughs> and we're gonna go to a quick replay here. See how Marissa Howard ran away from the field tonight. Sat back early. 
moved hard in the middle. Yeah, once she went up to the front, never, no one could relinquish this for her. When she made a move, it was done decisively. And that was the closest it got there. With 400 meters to go, we, we had a race on our hands, but she knew that that standard and that personal best was within reach, and she went for it. Uh, I think that this is not the last we've seen of her this season. And kind of like how our OTQ Heat uh, winner uh, mentioned before, you can, when you're in the lead, you can tell just based off the splashes and just what's going on in the water barrier behind you, just where the competition is at. And so she knew someone was coming up on her and prevented uh, anyone from taking the, the win. All right, and Marissa's now down track side, so we can hear from our guys at the Running Report one more time. Hey, Marissa, that was a really a definition of a gutsy race. You went out there and you did not let up at the end. Just what was going through your mind and when you're going in those last, like, four laps when it was really all you against the clock? Yeah. My coach said after three laps, just go. He said everybody that's won tonight makes a big move uh, halfway through the race. So that was kind of the plan to go after three laps, and it got really, really hard with the wind, but I kept fighting, and... That's my best opener ever. So excited to build from there. Most definitely, most definitely. And you really gave us a show for the last race of the day. You were so close to that Olympic um, qualifying no. time right there. But can we hear a little bit more about the, the club that you're wearing on your chest? What's oh, your yeah. team? So my coach uh, coaches Idaho Foot, um, which is an elite team that he just started playing the last year. And then Ruja is a nonprofit that I run for. Um, they um, work in Uganda, and I went on a mission trip with them. And since I'm not sponsored right now, I thought, hey, I might as well represent something that means something to me. So um, I love representing these two things on my chest. That's awesome. It's always awesome to see all those clubs supporting the athletes. Is there anything that uh, the people watching can do to help support your club? Um, well, Ruja, you can donate, which is really awesome. Um, just ruja.org. And um, yeah, just uh, prayers for the children in Uganda that we work with. Well, it's definitely appreciate you so much, Marissa. You already, we could tell the wind is picking up as we speak. Yeah. Appreciate you, great race, and we're, we're happy, we're gonna be excited to see you again, most Thank likely. You. Thank you. No problem. You, you know, the, the big benefit All of winning right. the race is we get you, you get camera time to plug. Oh yeah, the, whatever the, sponsors you want. The sponsors, the things that are important to you, you can give a message to those at home who are watching. So, you know, if you needed more motivation to win, yeah, I don't know what else. That's we the can free real estate, the free ad space. But yeah, I mean, we as we wrap up things here, big shout out to all the sponsors, those who sponsor the races, yeah. Heartbreak Running Company for uh, you know really stepping up to sponsor the event, helping us put this out on YouTube for all of you guys to enjoy for free. We're gonna do it again uh, on May 21st for the New York City qualifier. I have to find some fitness between now and then for a race that I'll be running at that meet, uh, and so. Yeah, a great night of racing here tonight. What, what really stood out to you? Well, uh, first off, I'd be remiss not to mention the Trials of Miles guys, Dave and Cooper, yeah. putting on this event for the athletes, and now some fans. Yeah. We saw some tons of personal bests, some qualifiers, some really exciting races tonight, so big shout out to them uh, for making this happen. Um, for me, I think the race of the day was Tantio... Um, Lopez, yeah, yeah. correct, uh, and send the Me Mexican national record, closing so hard, 144 out here, doing it, uh, you know, s like that that final 100, that's the sort of thing we're going to be looking for in the rounds come Rio. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Where are we going? Tokyo. Tokyo. Yeah. So the other thing, too, is just that that race really just set it off for the rest of the night. There were just, you know, the high school races were, were, were good. Uh, we got qualifiers in... Uh, 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 like it's escaping right now because it's just still still settling. Yeah. Well, can we talk Laura Galvin? I think yeah. that was one of the huge races of the evening. One second 11. shy of the Olympic qualifier. Yeah, I, I think she's looking really good heading into Tokyo, and the I think that the big thing for me tonight was it was just good racing. Yeah. Like one after another, we just had competitive, fun races to watch to call on our end, and you know. Especially big shout out to the running report guys down on the field. They, they had a blast. They were great in the booth earlier today. I think that we're going to be on the undercard next time after. I what think they, that's what's going to end up happening. They, they did an excellent job. And, uh, you know, I think uh, this is just good old track and field. We're, we're peaking right now. This is, if you're not a fan of the sport in like 
days like this, then I don't know what you're waiting for. It doesn't get that much better. Yeah, and so again, you know, thanks to everyone who tuned in, those who shared the link, you know, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, texted it to you know, your mother. Uh, like it was just, you know, a great night. I'm glad we got to do this again. Uh, in Texas, Mother Nature dealt us some humidity. This time around, we had a little bit of wind, but not the worst conditions. So maybe the third time's a charm, and we land some really perfect conditions in New York out on I Icon Stadium. Oh yeah, a very fast track. So looking forward to that. So that's it from here at the University of St. Mary in Leavenworth, Kansas. I'm Chris Chavez. I'm Kyle Merber. And so thank you guys for tuning in tonight. We'll catch you on May 21st back here on the Sidious Mag YouTube channel for some more Trials of Miles action presented by Heartbreak Running Company. Good night, YouTube.